Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'd like to note that Council is conducting this meeting in person and via conference call in accordance with the Municipal Government Act, Section 199. Council meetings can take place in person as long as physical distancing of two meters can be maintained between participants. At this time, according to Alberta Health, public attendance at Council meetings should be facilitated through virtual means. If you've submitted a comment request, the Chair will call on you at the appropriate time. The Chair may also ask for comments and concerns from the public relating to a particular topic. And at this time, phone lines will be unmuted. If you would like to speak, please state your name. We ask that only one member of the public speaks at a time. All persons will be allotted 10 minutes to speak, as per our procedural bylaw. We ask that if the meeting recesses, that any callers hang up and call back as in as the meeting reconvenes. This helps with call quality. Please note this call is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website and or social media. To eliminate background noise, please mute your phone during the meeting. Everyone has a right to be present at council meetings and council committee meetings. Any attendees that are considered disruptive to the progression of this meeting may be removed at the discretion of the chair as per the Municipal Government Act, Section 198. We thank you for your cooperation and understanding. And because we have some members of council participating virtually, we will conduct a roll call uh, prior to convening our meeting. Reeve Amber Link is here. Deputy Reeve Clausen. I'm here in person. Councillor Wilson is not able to be with us today. Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Eichert. Here. Councillor Kester. Here. Councillor Armstrong. Here. Additionally, just a note, our voting procedure will be modified at our virtual or at our kind of hybrid teleconference meetings. I will call for any councillor who is opposed to a motion to indicate verbally. For any motions with expressed opposition, we will conduct a roll call vote. We have an agenda before us. Does anybody have any additions or changes? Uh, excuse me. Um, Reeve, <coughs> I want, I'd like to add the, um, the discussion on the Muirfield Speargrass uh, utility servicing. I think that can go into unfinished business. I don't think... I have to ask administration. I don't think it needs to be in camera. It's just we're just just filling out what we've. I think we just have to just a continuation of the of that discussion just to see where we're going with this. C Cao Henderson, does it work to put uh, that discussion under two point two three? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Any other additions to the agenda? Just an addition for uh, Reeves' attendance. Addition for Growth Management Board, October 5th in Red Deer. We'll put that under 2.24. We also had some correspondence that was circulated after the agenda was er, circulated. So under 5.1 correspondence, uh, we will add, there's a letter from the Strathmore Horseshoe Club. And that was circulated to Council via email and there's also a paper copy uh, at your seat. Any other My additions? My apologies, Amber. Excuse me? Yes, Donna? Amber? Yes, Councillor Baker? Um, I didn't hear... 2.24 uh, from Scott. I couldn't quite hear what he was bringing to, to the ratify agenda. Reeves' attendance at a growth... Oh. Management Board Rural Caucus from October 5th in Red Deer. Thank you. And we added 2.23 uh, utility servicing for Muirfield. Okay, thank you. We'll try and speak into our mics a little better. Any other additions to the agenda? If not, a motion to approve, please. I'll move. Councillor Eichert has moved. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. The minutes were circulated from our organizational meeting of October 20th. Any errors or omissions? If 
taken out a motion to approve. So moved. Councillor Armstrong has moved. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We also had the minutes from our regular council meeting October 20th. Any errors or omissions? If not, a motion to approve. So moved. Deputy Reeve Clausen has moved. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 2.11, bylaw for 2020-30. I'll move that the process for the Wheatland County Council meeting as it pertains to the scheduled public hearings will be as follows. Public hearing, first reading if required, then consideration for further readings of the bylaw for those public hearings that have been closed. I further move that the above process will take place with the absence of resolutions to go into and out of council before and after each public hearing. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. I'll call the public hearing for bylaw 2020-30 to order. Welcome everybody. Does any member of the public have an objection to any councillor sitting on council for the public hearing? And can administration please verify that notice of the public hearing was circulated in accordance with the MGA? We can confirm that, yes. Thank you. And were there any written submissions? We received no written submissions. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Council. This is Megan Williams here to present Bylaw 2020 30. The, packet, er, the report starts on page 21 of Council's package. The subject parcel is 86.45 acres in size and is located directly adjacent to the town of Strathmore's north boundary and is accessed from Highway 817. The location plan is found on page 26 of Council's package. The application is to redesignate the whole parcel from Agricultural General to the Rural Business District in order to facilitate development permit applications for a variety of uses, including an entertainment venue and agritourism businesses. Staff circulated the application to external agencies, internal departments, and adjacent landowners. No comments were received, however, staff did receive several phone calls requesting more information on the proposed development. The aerial imagery is on page 27 of Council's package. Currently, the applicant has an approved development permit for a market garden and over the last few years has participated in standalone events such as open farm days. The applicant wants to hold these agritourism type events more frequently and they also want to start operating a wedding venue. If the redesignation is approved, the applicant will be submitting a development permit to change the use of the existing garage to an entertainment venue where they'll host the weddings. The agritourism events will occur throughout the property. The proposed development aligns with the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, Municipal Development uh, Plan, and Regional Growth Management Strategy, as it will contribute to the diversification of the agricultural sector and it will contribute to the local tourism sector. Staff is recommending that Council grant second and third reading to Bylaw 2020-30 as the proposal supports the strategies, objectives and policies within the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, Regional Growth Management Strategy and Municipal Development Plan. Staff's recommendations can be found on page 21 and Council has three options before them. They can approve the recommendation, not approve it or approve an alternate. This does conclude my presentation and I am available for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And does the applicant wish to speak? Any persons in support of the application who would like to speak? Any persons with concerns or who are opposed to the application who would like to speak? And we'll just, for quality, just ask anybody who's not speaking just to mute their uh, phone, please. Any final comments from administration? 
No final comments. Thank you. Thank you. Question for clarification. <clears throat> the piece of property to the southeast in that corner, is that a commercial property or, or is it just looks like it's left in the middle of a... Does that have any effect on what's going on there? One that's directly uh, aligned with the north boundary of Strathmore. I know there's a compressor station there, there, but the rest of that property, is that all part of that? At one time it was in Canada. I don't know who has it now. I assume it's still in Canada. Through the chair, or th um, that's, it's under direct control District 5. Um, so there's light industrial and light um, medium industrial uses there as well, and outdoor storage. Um, let me just take a quick look at the DP. See if it's on the thing. It's not. Okay. So that whole parcel is direct control. It's not an agricultural parcel sitting there. Um, okay. That's what it looks like. I believe the whole of that okay. is um, direct control, yes. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, I think page one with the yeah. green shows the designations. Page 28. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Any chunk of egg general in there? Any other questions during the public hearing? I will close the public hearing for bylaw 2020-30, council consideration of further readings. I'll move second reading of bylaw 2020-30. Deputy Reeve Clausen has moved second reading. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Um, Councillor Eichert will move third reading. Councillor Eichert has moved third. Any discussion? <coughs> is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to the public hearing for bylaw 2020 33. We'll open the public hearing. Welcome. Does any member of the public have an objection to any councillor sitting on council for the public hearing? And can you please verify that notice of the public hearing was circulated in accordance with the MGA? Staff can confirm that, yes. Thank you. And any written submissions? We received no written submissions. Perfect. Morning. Good morning again. Megan Williams back to present bylaw 2020-33. This packet or this report is on page 32 of council's package. The proposed redesignation encompasses the majority of two quarter sections, totaling approximately 318.54 acres with an access off of Highway 840. The location plan is on uh, found on page 40 of council's package. It is 1.6 kilometers south of the Knee Hill border and 6.3 kilometers north of Rosebud. The application is to redesignate the whole of these, sorry, the application is to redesignate the 318.54 acres from Agricultural General to Direct Control District 3 in order to facilitate the development permit applications for multi-unit dwellings and the potential commercialization of some of their existing developments, such as the metal shop, uh, such as a metal shop. In addition to the redesignation, staff is proposing amendments to the direct control district three in order to include the communal child care use and to bring clarification to the density section. Staff circulated the application to external agencies, internal departments, and to adjacent landowners. No comments were received outside of one phone call requesting more clarification on the proposal. 
the aerial imagery is on page 41, and the current and proposed development is on page 42. Since their application for a redesignation, the applicant has obtained development permits for one manufactured dwelling, as indicated on the proposed development plan at location 6. In addition to redesignating their parcel to the existing DC3 district, staff included a number of amendments, including a definition for communal child care, including the communal child care use under permitted uses, and clarification to the density district regarding single unit dwellings. With the special regulations, staff clarified the number of permissible industrial operations per colony. The proposal aligns with the policies and objectives of the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, Municipal Development Plan, and Regional Growth Management Strategy. Its existing water servicing also aligns with the Water Act, Water Ministerial Regulation, and the approved water management plan for the South Saskatchewan River Basin in Alberta. Staff is recommending that Council grant second and third reading to bylaw 2020-33 as the proposal supports the strategies, objectives and policies within the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, Regional Growth Management Strategy and Municipal Development Plan. Staff's recommendation can be found on page 32 and Council has three options before them. They can approve the recommendation, not approve it or approve an alternate. This concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions. Thank you. Does the applicant wish to speak? Any persons in support of the application who would like to speak? Any persons with concerns or opposed to the application who would like to speak? Any final comments or questions? Questions. Wait, but did the, did, does this application, does this also amalgamate those two quarters under one title? No. They're still two separate titles. Are they planning on doing that? Because in, within that, I know I went through that with the one, the same type of applicant out in my area and they were having all kinds of trouble every time they applied for a building permit, they were in violation of the setbacks off the quarter lines, pronounces, so they amalgamated titles into one title so they didn't have that quarter line running through the middle. Anything going to happen here? Not that I'm aware of. That wasn't any of the discussions that I held with the applicant. I know, but when you look at the siting there, they're already in violation of setbacks with their buildings, right? Well, doesn't that make it make more sense for them to amalgamate those two quarters under one title while they're in the process so they don't end up back in here in a year because they're trying to build something and they hit the wall because of the setback? So just for the council that's participating virtually, we're looking at page 41 of the package. So I'll just... Um I'll chime in here uh, through the Reeve and unless um, Megan has any comments. Um, the direct control bylaw, it may allow for the buildings and those uses to be close together. However, <clears throat> I mean, we can do some further analysis to that point, Councillor Armstrong, because yeah, you do make a good point. There is maybe some potential there. However, I think the, the catch and, um, and in a positive way is the direct control bylaw. So we can definitely analyze that, but I do believe the direct control bylaw will allow for the flexibility of those setbacks for those two um, quarters. And I'll chime in with, with Megan if you have any additional comments, but otherwise, those are my comments. I'm just, I'm just concerned that a year from now, they're gonna to decide to build a machine shed or something, and they come in for the development permit, and they're gonna say, well, you, you're, you're in violation of our setbacks because it's a, you're on a quarter line. And if you've, they're going through this process now, you may as well look at that option if it's, if it, if it's, if it's. So it looks like page 37 has setbacks for this direct control district. Um, 125 feet from the nearest that's limit. On the, that's on the outside, it's not on yeah. the internal. But then I, 
if I understand correctly, these would be the only setbacks that would apply to this whole district because it's under DC. And then it would just be the 25 feet from the property line in all other cases. So that 125 feet was uh, nearest limit of the public road right of way. And the 25 feet or 7.62 meters is from the property line in all other cases. And then minimum yard setback between buildings and structures would be five feet. And this would, I think, supersede any other um, setback requirements because it's under direct control. Please. Um, and then through the chair, um, what may look like buildings on the, the map that's included in council's package, if you look at the aerial imagery, they look like hay, hay bales. So as far as we're aware, there's currently no, um, no setback infringements within this district. So another question then, is Sunshine under direct control yet? Um, do, you, Sunshine Colony. do you know where Sunshine Colony is? Yeah, north, east, east of Hazar, eight miles. And uh, Madam Reeve, through while Megan's looking that up, to your point, yes, that's exactly it. Okay. And I guess if administration can just okay. confirm that development is consistent with the direct control bylaw. Okay. Because I know they had problems with that, exactly what I'm talking about. And if they're under direct control, then it is an issue. If it isn't an issue, that's fine. It's just yeah, and because it says property line, like I haven't looked at the definition of that, so it's good to check, make sure it's not going to cause an issue for sure. Any other questions for the public hearing for twenty twenty dash thirty three? It's getting the zoning on that. Looks like it. Lovely, but it, it may not have gone through the direct control yet. I don't know. Through the chair, um, they're still underneath an agricultural general district. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing for bylaw 2020 33. Council's consideration of further readings. I'll move second reading. Councillor Kester has moved second reading. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Consideration of third reading. I'll move third reading. I'll move third reading. Deputy Reeve Clausen has moved third reading. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 2.13, bylaw 2019-40, road closure. We've already held first reading and the public hearing previously for this. We were just waiting on uh, provincial approval. Thank you, Madam Reeve. So on page 44 of your agenda package, you'll see 
Uh, road closure bylaw 2019-40. These are the final readings for this road closure bylaw. Um, it had gone through the process already here, first reading, public hearing earlier this year. It was sent off to the minister for approval and we re received it back. <clears throat> now the next process will be uh, council approving second, third reading and uh, disposal of the property to the adjacent landowners. Uh, just to note the parcel will be consolidated into the adjacent lands. Any questions from council? Just once again, I'll just remind anybody on the phone lines just to mute your phone if you're not speaking. Council's wishes. We're looking for second and third. You betcha. Um, Separate motions, please. Second consideration for second reading first. I'll move consideration for second reading of bylaw 2019-40. Any council discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. A resolution for third reading. I'll move third reading. Councillor Eckert has moved third. Any council discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 2.14, bylaw 2020-37, our public behavior bylaw. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Council. Uh, just before we begin, Madam Chair, um, I need to make an amendment to the bylaw prior to first reading. Um, I need to add in a repeal clause to it. Um, so I would like to amend this bylaw under um, Section 9, an effective date to add a repeal clause to say that bylaw 2012-80 is hereby repealed upon the passing and signing of bylaw 2020-37 with approval. Perfect. And good morning. Uh, so I am here to present the uh, public behavior bylaw today for consideration. Uh, so in 2012, the bylaw was first put in place and it was time to review it because some of the sections were out of date and some um, language needed to be cleaned up to modernize it. Also, um, I was requested by our operations uh, building management uh, department to add some things to deal with tobacco and cannabis vaping in use within certain distances of doorways and on county-owned uh, facilities to make it in line with the uh, Tobacco Reduction Act. So, um, so when I after uh, I prepared the bylaw, I reviewed other bylaws from other jurisdictions that have similar issues that we do. Um, and after I brought this to planning and priorities, I put out requests to all of our RCMP detachments to get their feedback on it. And I received no written feedback. I just received verbal feedback from one commander who felt it was uh, it was adequate. So um, yeah, and so, so if we are to pass the bylaw today, we will. Um, hand out the new copy to all of the affected parties so they understand it and I'll go over it with them and then the operations staff can put up signage at all the different buildings to uh, note that no smoking or vaping within five meters of these doorways and that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you. And so just for clarity, those aspects of the bylaw are just to be consistent with provincial law? Correct. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the bylaw? If not, a um, motion for first reading. I'll move first reading. Councillor Kester has moved first reading. Any discussion? Oh, yes, Councillor Kester, can you just clarify that that's as amended with the repeal clause? As amended with the repeal clause, I believe section nine, if I heard it right. Perfect, thank you. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried.
A resolution. Moved second reading. Councillor Bigger has moved second reading. Any discussion? Motion is carried. Just a process question. Would you rather do, we do a roll call for a unanimous consent for third reading or does this process suffice? It suffices. Okay. A motion for unanimous consent to proceed to third reading? So moved. Councillor Armstrong has moved. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried unanimously. Third reading. I'll move third reading. Councillor Armstrong will also move third reading. <laughs> Any discussion? Motion is carried. Thank you. We appreciate the updates. We'll move to page 60 in our council package, meeting event calendar 2021. There was just a small uh, error in our uh, meeting calendar that was presented at our organizational meeting, so this is just to correct that error. And I forget where it was, but this is the correct one. Uh, it was on uh, November 16th. So the original Brentham administration, the uh, original calendar presented had an MPC meeting on November 9th and then another uh, MPC meeting on November 16th. However, it was just a, a transposition error. We, we meant to put a council meeting on November 16th, um, just to, to fall in line with our regular schedule. So this one in our agenda package is the correct one. A motion to approve. We just do this so that all of our council meetings are approved and we don't have to give notice. Councillor Eichert has moved approval of the amended meeting event calendar 2021. Any discussion? Can I request a printed copy of that? Yeah, there should be one with, with, with your agenda. If not, I can. Come with it? Yeah. Oh, oh there it is. <laughs> Thank you. They've got us. They've always got us. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Eichert has moved. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Administration, a scheduling of, uh, and I would actually prefer if we could schedule a committee of the whole meeting. I don't know, um, CAO Henderson, sure. what date? Yes, that thinking? works for sure. Um, so one item that we really would like to discuss with council is the uh, our upcoming budget, so our operating capital budget. Um, so what we have, uh, we kind of have an internal uh, schedule that we're kind of working with here uh, that includes the conclusion of our budget engagement with uh, ratepayers. So that's still ongoing. Um, so kind of our plan is to get um, digital and paper copies provided to council of the operating capital budget and then to meet with council on Tuesday, November 24th. Um, just to kind of go through everything, um, what we can do is we can uh, publish that and uh, kind of do it under a committee of the whole as well. How does everybody's calendar look for Tuesday, November 24th? I'm fine. I'm good. Not, is that planning? What is that? that? Just budget? We would make a committee of the whole, and the main agenda item would be budget. Fuck. You're thinking 9 a.m., CAO Henderson? Uh, yes, that would work. If no, if that uh, works for everybody's calendar, if we could have a motion to approve the meeting. Also move. Councillor Bigger <coughs> has moved. Any discussion? 
Yeah, Committee of the Whole for Tuesday, November 24th, convening at 9 a.m. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 2.23. I titled Mirfield Utility Servicing. Is that consistent? Is that what you said or? Yes. Um, okay. I just, um, we had a um, presentation done by um, CAO Henderson about what the internal, co uh, internal costs uh, opposed to the contracting costs for for servicing of Muirfield slash uh, Speargrass, and um, and I I think we need to flesh out what council's wishes are on this because this will make a huge difference on on the WRC's operating on the operational side. It won't sh it won't affect the water production, but it will affect the operational their operational side. So. If council's wishing is, if council's wishes are to continue along the lines of, of what uh, the CAO has recommended, then uh, I think we just need to get that, uh, get that out there and, and get some timelines in place and all that kind of stuff in order to, when this is going to start, start happening. So that's I just we just need to continue that discussion. So. There is mud. I don't. Have it. Oh. Sorry. Council, sorry, Councilor Reggie here. I would like to see um, that. Um, like, I don't know how much time they need, but I would like that. Uh, you know, I mean, for for sure, the sake of fear us, and now that Murphy has got it on, I think it makes sense for us to definitely look into our own our own sort of thing. I mean, um, we're, we're going to cost cost recovery. It just makes sense. Um, I don't know. But I don't know what how many days. We have ninety days would be, you know, a good um, um, timeline. I, I'm not sure. Any thoughts? CAO Henderson, um, can you just, it, actually it would be on the council resolution tracker. Um, let me just go. Sorry, I'm on a county laptop because mine's been having issues and it doesn't have Adobe so I'm like scrolling so I'm just finding the page so I'm faster. Um, I'm just looking at the, our last resolution on this. So... Should be page 97, I think. Is it page 99? Uh, sorry, Reblink, would it be page 99? Council Resolution 2020-10-48? Yes, that's what I was looking for. So um, I see that our last direction was council directed county administration to work with the Wheatland Regional Corporation to explore incremental costs regarding water servicing. Further, that administration report back to council at the next scheduled council meeting regarding this matter. So CAO Henderson, if you would just be able to perhaps um, share at this point uh, what your follow-up on that was. I think we were just trying to determine that all incremental costs uh, to look at that, uh, the operation servicing, what that would be. Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of, I was going to kind of go over this in my report, um, but kind of follow up to that resolution. So I did contact, uh, the GM at the, at WRC, Leah Jensen, um, uh, on October 21st. And there is no other incremental cost behind the actual water operation. Um, if like we were to kind of go through one of the other two options besides keeping, uh, our water service, our water operation with WRC. Um, so there are no other incremental costs that she kind of identified. Um, I also did send over the kind of work to Leah as well, um, just for her information, just to kind of let her know that 
um, this is something that Wheatland was considering anyways. There's no positive, there was no council direction at that point, but um, just something that we were considering just kind of uh, for cost savings. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. So, Councillor Eckert, you're looking for council direction today? Well, yeah, you know, my, my pet peeve is always how slow everything gets pushed down the road. Now, this is not fair for, if we are looking at cost recovery, that's the plan going forward in the county. This would definitely seem to be one of the steps we would take, that we would do this internally. But it's also that we've also got another partner that's involved in this, which is WRC, and they're doing our operations cost. And we have to find somebody, we have to figure out whether or not they're going to take over the cost at Muirfield, take over the, the work at Muirfield, willing, even if they're willing to take over the work at Muirfield. So I just need, being on the board, I just need to be able to, to have some saying that, yes, it's the will of council that we are going to do this internally, or no, we're not going to do this internally, and we're going to do this. But we know that there's a there's a huge difference in the in the cost of doing service. Um, I'm not sure what will uh, what council's will is to basically subsidize a board to do the work. So I, I just need to know what when we go back when we have our our meeting on the 17th, the WRC meeting on the 17th. I just need to be able to say, look, this is the way council, or the county is going on the operations of Muirfield and Speargrass. So, like, because Speargrass, or sorry, Muirfield is just up in the air. So, um, so I just want, I just want something hard and fast now that says we're going to do this, and then WRC is now we'll have to make that adjustment or figure out how we're going to do that. Well, if I remember right. Um, sorry, Don, I'm bigger here. Um, it was about two hundred and sixty thousand dollars, or something like that, that we would save. That we would be an, in a savings. I, I'm not positive, but um, that would bring Fairgrass fairly close to cost recovery. I think it just makes sense that, I mean, we're not using WRC water. If we could staff those two hamlets. Um, it would just make sense to take at least take Speargrass and Mirfield out of the WRC. To just a uh, comment personally from myself uh, for transparency, I think if we're going to consider this decision, my preference would be to make some of that financial information public if possible. Um, and I would defer to administration to advise on that. Um, just so that the rationale for any decision made is public. Um, I'm not sure, CAO Henderson, if you're prepared to do that right now. I know this was a little bit of short notice uh, to put this on the agenda for right now. Um, as CAO Henderson stated, he um, could potentially speak to it at his report. Um, or CAO Henderson, would you pre be prepared to present that information at this point? Um, sure. So um, let me just pull up the report that we prepared. So realistically, when we're kind of looking at this, there were three options that we're kind of looking at. And kind of for administration, there was like a tipping point with um, bringing on Muirfield. So there's a couple kind of things that go on there. So with Muirfield, I believe there was about 1,400 hours, additional uh, servicing hours that we have. Uh, that's a requirement to service near field. So at this point, we were kind of projecting about 4,400 hours um, of water operator services that are required. So what we did was we kind of came up with three different scenarios. Um, so scenario one would be, would be fully internal. So we have our own staff on, on hand. So you'd have three full-time staff. Um, so that would kind of, what we equated that out to is about $370,000. Um, Option scenario two would be a hybrid, and kind of what we propose in there is that we would have um, two full-time staff that would try to cover approximately 3,600 hours, and then the remainder of the hours would be covered by WRC. So 
the total hybrid cost that we had was 309000 And then scenario three would be to remain just 100% contracted out. Um, and that would be about 512000 So kind of the differences between scenario one, uh, scenario two and three is about 200000 And then scenario one is about 140000 So this kind of uh, benefits of all scenarios, um, scenario one and two. So the, the benefit of scenario one is that we kind of gain, um, we'd be paying for about 6,300 hours uh, of of just labor in general. And the work that would be not use, utilized in the water servicing could be transferred into the hamlet, which would kind of increase the service level in those hamlets. So that's kind of a, a qualitative factor that would also have to be kind of considered in this. Um, and then kind of another thing to disappoint from administration is that um, there is a, a contract that we, an inter, interagency agreement that we, we are in with, uh, with the WRC. So if council does choose to kind of go down the road of um, canceling or changing the way the service is being provided, that's being no service at all, just some, we should provide notice um, in the contract of that say 90 days. Um, another thing that council probably should consider as well is that um, with the change of these, it probably would impact the operations of the WRC, so you'd want to provide them notice um, if you do choose to go down a different road. Um, and probably what, what I would advise the council anyways is that um, you try to get within a certain number of, say, our internal, uh, internal costing. If they can meet it within a percentage amount, that would be good. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I would suggest. Thank you. And then just a question for Clarity, CAO Henderson. Uh, the numbers that you were referencing, that was to do all of the operations within the hamlets, not, I don't think we've broken out to just do Speargrass and Muirfield. I think we had been looking at just doing it internally because of the economies of scale of then servicing all the hamlets. Yes, that's correct. So um, administration can definitely look into just doing specific hamlets. Um, <coughs> any, any suggestions we can definitely look into, um, definitely not opposed. But this, these are just kind of three just high-level, broad scenarios we've kind of looked at. Um, definitely open to suggestions. Um, one kind of power we do have is that economy of scale that you have mentioned. Um, so with us being a larger organization, there's multiple sunk costs that we have. Uh, building, uh, like our just general building, like it doesn't really change if we add three staff. Human resources costs, that doesn't change if we add a couple more staff. Um, if those are kind of sunk costs that we already are incurring and won't really change. It doesn't matter. If, uh, it, it probably would matter at some point, but not with the just three employees kind of thing that we were suggesting. Can I make a couple comments? Yes, please go ahead. When we started this, I'd ask for apples to apples. I know what the WRC, there's money in that 500,000 that goes to reserves. There's money in that 500,000 that goes to insurance. And in the county's calculations, I don't believe there's any money going into reserves or insurance. So to come up with the 570 and keep that number in that, I don't think is, is apples to apples. We're just going to compare labor and vehicle. I'm sure WRC can pull those two numbers out and tell you how much it would be. Apples to apples again. And furthermore, when, when Councilor Eichert said there'd be no impact to the water, I don't know if that's true or not true. There has not been a study done for it. If the manpower portion of WRC uh, Council County pulls out, it might be to the advantages of the villages to pull out too. And if that happens, one and a half employees is not going to run the water treatment plant. 
and they'll have to hire more. There'll be more expenses. There'll be more money for reserves, everything. The budgets will change for the water, and the price of water will go up. Again, I know when you're sitting there and thinking, yeah, it would be nice to have it all there, but I don't see any apples to apples, hard, fast numbers, or even close numbers. I can understand what the county did, but it is not comparing the same mythology that WRC has. If WRC was just to take the manpower in the vehicles and plunk that number in there, I'm sure it'll be way less than the 570,000. That's all I'm saying. Make it apples to apples so council can look at it. When, when uh, that contract the WRC had and the price of manpower was at $40, and we decided that was not transparent because we had a flat fee for water. And this flat fee for water paid for all that overhead. No much different than the county has all the overhead and it's paid and it's looked after in a different budget, different line item, different employees. To make it transparent, to make it apples to apples, what the expense actually was for, that's the way the budget was developed. And I don't see the county doing that. And if the county council don't want to see it, well, fine. I, I, uh, I can't support anything unless it's accurate and true and apples to apples. Okay. So I have a question, Brian, if I can. Um, is, is the numbers that you used and you given, um, is there a breakdown of, um, like I'm wondering, is insurance, is, is, is everything else in cover, covered in those numbers? Um, yeah, I, I could find the general breakdown, but I think the kind of administration's take on it, I'm definitely open to ideas, and if we're not kind of producing the most quality, accurate work, then council can definitely weigh in on it. But when we're just comparing, like, manpower to manpower, so we're going to have to insure our stuff regardless. Um, wastewater treatment, or the water plants are insured, um, like our buildings are insured. I kind of go back to that economy of scale point. Um, we're going to require an audit regardless of if we have internal staff or we don't. Um, if we had five employees, we'd need an audit. If we had 200 employees, we'd need an audit. Um, so all of those costs are kind of sunk. Like we, we have to pay them regardless. Um, I think that's kind of the point that, that I would make on the sunk cost. Um, if if council thinks that it's not like apples to apples, that that's okay. But I, I think I just need some guidance on either what to add, what not to add, what to take out. But the way that administration sees and it's kind of gone through a couple of different departments is that this is just the way we kind of see it, just manpower versus manpower. Like we have some costs, the WRC has some costs. Kind of the issue um, that's maybe arising is that um, we're almost paying for the sunk cost of another organization, right? Like that's kind of what I kind of almost boil this down to, which is which is fine. I, I think it's just that you know, with you know, the changing of the service that the county needs to provide now with us taking over the lakes of Muirfield, I think that's kind of the tipping point where it almost seems like okay, like. There, there's a shift here where there's 1,400 more hours. So that 1,400 more hours is honestly almost the exact difference of the, the cost increase versus scenario one and three. So w with that, and I'm not sure if, I believe the WRC even mentioned that they may be able to take on the work with less employees or with the same amount of employees. I don't know. Um, I definitely don't run the WRC and never have claimed to, or I have no... Uh, not much detail or knowledge of their operations with the exception of that they provide good service to the county for 
um, water service in the hamlet. So um, it, it definitely sh- could be a discussion that uh, the board members have with the, the WRC board at the next board meeting um, and just try to see if they can come down and pray. Um, I think that's one definite option. Or council could also, it's really up to the will of council. Um, we, we've definitely kind of provided our analysis and um, yeah, that's kind of, kind of it. Definitely open to more questions if you do have any though. So, so just to finish that thought, Brian, I understand all that, but the WRC has audit costs too. They have insurance costs too, and they appropriated them out into their budget. If they were to just to say, well, we have these costs anyways, then our manpower would come way down and they'd have to get the money from the water because it's the only way we get money. We can't tax. So you take all that away, all those overhead costs remain. There might be one employee, a half-time employee that might have to, if they shut it down, there would be a half-time employee, I believe would probably be, wouldn't be needed. But that audit fees, insurance fees, the vehicles, maybe you wouldn't need a vehicle, get rid of one of the vehicles, but it's, uh, yeah. If you take it away, something's going to happen on the other side. It's a simple math thing. So it looks better over here, but then the price of water goes up over there. And that those hasn't been done. Uh, to my knowledge, WRC haven't been asked if they would take over Merrifield and what they would charge. They can do it with what they have. That makes a difference, too. And I realize that this was kind of brought on to council as a, an agenda item today. But I don't, for me, all them questions haven't been asked. Due consideration has it been, been given. If... Uh, Council goes down this road, then the price of water becomes higher. Okay, I think it's a given for me. That's just my guess. I haven't worked it out on a piece of paper. I'm I'm not that good with paper, but I'm thinking that's what's going to happen. So then the next question is going to be: Will WRC? You have all this overhead. Why don't you just fold into a municipality and they would just take you over and they wouldn't have incur any extra costs? Because, like you say, they always getting an over. They're always getting an audit and they're always paying the insurance, and there would be no extra cost to the municipalities if uh, that's correct thinking or not. I would say it's debatable. There has to be a lot of consideration given to this whole total package. And it's not just Wheatland County you're affecting, you're affecting two other for sure municipalities and potentially a third. And that has direct impacts on their budgets too. Okay, that's, you all know my thoughts and I'm just trying to be thorough and fair and transparent. Just go and say, yeah, it makes sense. I think it looks good. Uh, yeah, we're the county and we're big and we can take it in and it ain't going to cost us but two more employees or three. Good. I can't sell that to my neighbors out here. I would never buy another combine because it was green instead of red because it looks good because everybody else has one. No, I, I do things differently, Okay. a question and I don't know if anybody has the answer to this. Um, in terms of how other utility, water utility operations work, um, is it typical, like do most utility companies offer the servicing and the water or do they just produce, I know we've looked at the cost of water, 
from different um, utilities, whether they're municipal or privately run or that type of thing. Is that cost of water that we look at from those utility operators, and it's, I, if nobody can answer this, that's fine, we can research. Um, would that include a servicing component or would that be just on making water and include things like an audit and overhead to make water? Anybody know? Um, if you go to Rocky View, they have probably, I don't know, probably upwards of 70 individual companies that do nothing but produce water for these little subdivisions that have like 20 or 30 houses in them. So it can be just a, just a single use thing, right? It doesn't have to be. And then there are other companies out there that are, of course, bigger than that. But Rocky View would be an, an, an example of you could set up a, 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 a company just to deliver water. The, the water is, the hours in a plant are mandated by the province, days per week, so that's easy to budget for. The servicing out in the field is minimal, so you end up banking labour for that. So usually the contracts are written as the, the servicing in the field is per hour basis. So, and that's kind of what we're running in here, is, is, is the per hour basis is so high. But there's some things I wanted to clarify here too. Um, that my fellow councillor had mentioned about reserves that WRC put in, and I, unless I was mistaken, but at the WRC budget meeting, um, there was no reserve put away. It was a cash call, as mentioned, and the board accepted that. If there was an overage or something, there was cash call. So there is no reserve in WRC, as to my knowledge, for anything, and that was something that I opposed, but it went through. So there was. There is reserves. I don't have the papers in front of me anymore, and I can't think of where I put them on short notice. But there was reserves put in that manpower budget for vehicles and the water pump, I believe. I'm thinking we'd have to get them papers. Plus the 5% that, we, that the WRC charges on top of their cost, that 5% goes into reserves too. Because it doesn't spend money on anything else. It's just a surplus and it's a reserve. You know approximately what the reserve is sitting at for that board? Right now, I think the reserves got spent on, we're in a cash crunch until we get this phase three done. When the phase three is done, there'll be a final accounting done in the county and everybody will be money's owed to all the municipalities. There'll be a balancing act gone on. You'll have to have a meeting with all the municipalities and you'll have to decide if you want to borrow the money to get paid out or do you want to uh, uh, donate the money to WRC or borrow the money to pay or everybody pays an extra rate until the debts are paid off and finance it internally, I guess is the word I'm trying to find. That reckoning date is coming closer as I believe water to Rosebud will be done this year or thereabouts. And that was always the plan. It's probably be about a million dollars for short. And that was budgeted from the get-go, I believe, when MPE, before we were approved by the province, we were to be in the red for 10 years at minimum. And we were to be a million, million and a half, something like that, in debt from day one. That's what the municipal contributions being contributions was all pages and pages and pages of numbers. And it was consistent with all other water things that were being put in. Um, uh, Brian? Oh. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, no, sorry, Councilor Baker, you go ahead. I just think that, um, I mean, 
the servicing part adding on, like I think WRC was, if I understand it right, put there to make water. And with all the servicing to the hamlet, to the county, it's actually, it's so confusing and hard to um, budget. I mean, it just, it's, and then when you add on, if we add on Muirfield to this, it just gets more and more confusing. And we have a potential to be getting um, a community into hopefully um, cost recovery and we're getting closer if we do this. So uh, I think it's, if WIC makes water, they get paid for making water, it, it just makes it more simpler for even them. That's my thoughts. Um, yes, just Brian from administration. So this is, I think it's an excellent discussion, and I think a lot of these questions, um, there are some questions from council that kind of still remain unanswered. Um, what I would suggest um, is that the board members take this information to the WRC to have a discussion on it, and just to understand the full impacts that, uh, as Councilor Tester mentioned, the, the price of water could go up per cube, um, so we can quantify that as well. Um, this kind of analysis is just something that administration put together. Um, obviously, there's other steps that need to be taken with this, so it probably should be a discussion at the board level. Um, just to understand, maybe there is something we're definitely missing, um, not opposed to taking in further information if, if there is any. Um, but I, I do believe that uh, the board members should have a discussion with uh, the WRC board and just kind of determine uh, what the next steps are for uh, everyone. Um, thanks, Brian. I brought this up at WRC last meeting and basically said the county's taken on this exercise and um, said that we're, you know, looking at this and there is de definite cost savings for us and was basically told, well, that's your business to do what you want. They'll deal with it after. So um, that's already basically been done. I did mention, you know, at that cost, if the, if the board wanted to look at lowering that cost and, and they feel that um, that's a, oh they can only adjust that cost at budget, which, and I can understand Councillor Eichert's um, comments right now in bringing this forward because it is budget time for both WRC and the county, and this affects both of them. So I think this is timely. Um, I think we need direction from council um, to to pursue this or leave it alone or whatever, so we can have some direction at the board because we're jumping into budget there, and we'll have to change direction if we go this route. That makes any sense. And the cost of, well, well, cost of service and cost of water at the board have already been broken out. And yes, there might be some changes there, um, but it was broken out per hour. To, so it's, it's mostly separated now. Well, I think I'd like to make a motion, actually. Um, I'd like to move that council direct administration to give um, give some notice to WRC. Um, to prepare an internal solution for servicing of water for Muirfield and Speargrass and to look into that also for Gleeson and Rosebud and to give, I don't know, give 90 days notice that this is what's going to happen. I don't know, that's probably not in great words. But. Donna, would you just consider what we had originally discussed, just the servicing side for all of the county Hamlets where we have utilities, right? Yeah, yeah. Just because the yeah, model, please. I think the model of doing it internally hinges on doing all of it for it to be most efficient, if I understand that correctly. That's right. Yeah, thank you. And your, can you just repeat your motion or Margaret, did you get it? Donna, could you repeat it? 
one more time. And actually, if I could just make, just ask a question. When Brian was mentioning those numbers, the most cost-effective model is the hybrid model, and that could um, solve some of the issues with the manpower at WRC and make that more efficient in terms of the water delivery as well, based on, if I understand correctly, there's mandated hours that we need, and it's similar levels of operators that we would need for servicing and for water production. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I actually, I'll just actually make that motion that uh, council direct administration to give notice that the WRC, to the WRC that the county um, uh, give 90 day notice that we would be going to the hybrid. Um, well, I think we need to explore that. I don't think we can give notice that we would yeah. move to that. If I may, I think the notice that we would need to give, and I understand we're not following um, the agreement um, and all of the terms that were originally in the interagency service agreement, but the, from what I understand, we haven't changed it in writing, and the terms of the contract that we're in or the agreement that we're in do go until December 20th of 2022. It was a five-year term signed in 2017. My understanding is that we would need to give 90 days to terminate that agreement, and then it would be to explore what the option would be my preference, if it's possible, to come to an agreement to do a hybrid model with WRC, that looks like from the numbers that I heard uh, the most efficient for both operations. And if that's not possible, then it looks like the most cost effective uh, method of delivering this service for Wheeling County ratepayers is to do it internally. And then obviously there would be a, an expectation from our board members at WRC um, if there were sort of overarching expenses that were being allocated to servicing that are gonna impact the cost of water, that's for the board to sort out how they're gonna most effectively deliver the cost of water, if, if I'm understanding all of this correctly. So I think what we would need, according to the current agreement that we're in, is we would need a motion uh, to terminate the agreement, and it does say uh, that that would be done uh, 90 days prior written notice. So that's what we would be looking, I think that's what I'm hearing council considering is to provide that written notice to terminate the agreement. And then obviously there would be work that would need to be done following that. I don't know if that's where you're going, Donna. Yeah, that's that what my biggest concern is that we're both going into budgeting and it's not fair to just keep this going back and forth. So terminating the giving notification of 90 days of termination of the agreement would probably be the best. I know it sounds harsh, but I think that's what I'd like. Okay, so I'll move that Council Direct Administration. There's notice to uh, WRC to um, terminate the servicing of water or um, so it would be terminating the interagency service agreement, I think, right? Is that right? yeah. still what yeah. you reference at WRC? Yeah. Unless, and I'm, please administration weigh in if I'm not like following <laughs> this or interpreting council direction. No, um, right. <clears throat> no, I think, I think you are. Yeah. Margaret, is that clear as mud now? <laughs> Please. Sorry, Margaret. My words are. Turn your microphone. Do you have a microphone? If you read it, I'll repeat it. If that works. So just council did the move that council did it. Let me know this. So Councillor Bigger moved to direct administration to terminate the interagency servicing agreement with Wheatland Regional Corporation. That sounds perfect, thank you. That captures what you were, the direction you were going? Yeah, There's I a think motion that needs on, to be done. Sorry? Yeah, that's the motion on the floor. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Discussion. 
Glenn here. I can't support this motion without a full financial impact being done. This is potentially a half a million dollar budget item, and I can't support any motion without financial impact. That's always part of the package, financial impact. And then an idea just come to mind. When you're discussing with WRC, and uh, it was said the county, the audit and everything, can the WRC audit be under the umbrella of the county audit? And it wouldn't cost anything? Or discount? I don't know. Things can be looked into, but uh, without a full financial impact, I can't support it. It's bad governance, I believe. I don't, and I'll let, obviously, CAO Henderson could speak to this um, better than I could. Um, any of the, I don't think any of the boards that I sit on uh, could bring their audit under Wheatland County just because it's a separate organization. And obviously it would be different teams that you would be talking to in uh, executing the audit. And so I believe the audit would need to stay separate. Uh, yeah, the audit would have to stay separate. Um, even with the WRC, I believe they have different auditors than the county even. Um, that's not to say they could change, but typically there are two separate audits. Uh, and, and at this point, there's, there's no way that you could do uh, just one audit for the two. Glenn, do you just want to speak to uh, the details of what you would anticipate for a financial impact? I know you've spoken about the budget or about the audit. Um, I'm not sure what WRC pays for an audit. I know on other boards that I sit on kind of a similar scale of budget. Um, I'm just trying to think. Maybe $5,000? Also, I can tell. I talked to Leah briefly after it was provided to her, the county's assessment, how much it would cost. She said if we use the same mythology of calculating the cost, WRC would be cheaper. I've not been given that opportunity. And I don't know how else they could do it. Maybe there's other help. But to me, it has not been thoroughly researched and properly done. You want to go and vote on it? I can't stop you. I just can't support it. But that was the feeling. They just included, with the county included, we would be cheaper. So maybe some different relocating numbers and going back to more of a, a business case or a WRC had before with a flat fee and use the flat fee money for overhead. Maybe they could be shuffling the numbers around, make it look more attractive, I don't know. But at the end of the day, that's what it costs. Can the... Deputy Reeve Clausen, but at the end, it's still going to cost the same. Deputy Reeve Clausen, you had mentioned that you had brought um, this information that the county was looking at this to your board meeting. Yes. Was there any indication, and being cognizant that Wheatland County has two members out of five on that board, um, I know there have been discussions previously um, with that board. Um, can you just reiterate, you brought this forward to the board and what the board's response uh, to this information was? Basically gave disclosure that, yes, we are discussing this, we're looking at it. Um, there is a difference in costing to our benefit. Um, and if they wanted to look at the per hour rate to, to, to do something and the response back was that's what it is and we only just do that at budget. So. It's a, between a rock and a hard place here. I mean, I trust my staff at the county when they present something and have, you know, gone through and figured out that this is cost effective. Um, 
and, I, and I'm not saying I don't trust the board by any mean, but it's just they're, they're more reactionary in this. This is a whole scope of work that we can do on our side and save money, and it's going to affect that board. Um, basically, I was told the board will react to it, and if we have to lay people off, we have laid people off. I, I, Mr. Dreikert was there as well. That is 100 percent correct. Um, kind of gave the opportunity, like, look, if you want to look at doing some different costing and whatnot. Um, so if I understand correctly, with the Wheatland Regional Corporation Board, um, essentially the overall expenses are what the overall expenses are in their current method of providing water and servicing. And there is not, I haven't heard um, that there is a focus on finding more fiscally efficient ways to either provide water or provide servicing. So whether we are disproportionately paying more for servicing or disproportionately paying a smaller share of those costs, which would be the water production, we only really can control the fiscal efficiency if it's done internally, if I understand that correctly. There could be inefficiencies any which way. My priority is fiscal efficiency. We know the environment we are walking into. The, I think I was using the word fiscal reckoning before everyone in the province was using it. Like, things are going to get very challenging. We know we are going to have increased costs, we know we're going to have decreased revenue, and we are going into a very, very challenging uh, financial situation. We need to be focused, and we have been focused, our council has been focused on finding efficiencies. We can really only control that at this council table in terms of finding those efficiencies. That's my priority. I do want to do what's best for my rate peers in Gleeson. I don't want to see their water rates going sky high, but I do know that there are other uh, obvious, like I've looked at the water pricing comparisons. We need to find efficiencies. Okay. And if I understand correctly, real, real quick, that servicing does impact where we're going for cost recovery as well, because we integrate that into um, our utility costs for those same utility users in our hamlets. So whether we're controlling it internally or whether another board is controlling it, ultimately our utility users are paying it. So, Question to CAO Henderson. Can we share our your internal your, your servicing deal that we've got in our, I know that was done, I think it was done in camera, and rightfully so. I'm just wondering, can that be shared with, with the board so that they can look at look at the numbers and look what, yeah. and look at where we have to sort of get to as the board in order to, if we're going to continue running an operational branch of the business? Yes. Um, so I have I have shared this with uh, GM Jensen. Um, this that document. I believe I've shared both the detailed one and just the overarching one that kind of includes everything. Um, kind of my thought is that it would be taken back to the board, and the board can discuss it uh, in depth at the next board meeting. And then at that point, if the I guess the conversation from the board, if it truly is that they do not. Like, I, I still think there is, like, impacts that the county needs to understand, and I think that can only happen from after discussion with the WRC board on these numbers. Um, and that's kind of, I think I mentioned that before that motion was made by Councillor Baker. Um, I, I still think this needs to go to the board, but that, uh, that's just kind of my advice. Um, so, uh, sorry, maybe to be more direct with your question, Councillor Eichert, I believe that if um, if you want to have this discussion with the board, uh, you can add it to the board package, all the information. There's nothing, it's all a public document, so. Thank you. And when I, just moving forward, when it, if it goes this way, I'm not saying it is, but if it goes this way, I think about Standard had a water plant 
that was essentially the same plant, it's a little bigger now, but they, they had staffed that plant for themselves at some point in time. Now that plant services Gleeson, uh, Rocky Ford and Rosebud. So the staffing could be split up. Like there should be efficiencies being just in making water. It makes sense if they don't have to do the servicing. So, but that's for the board to figure out. And I mean, we have two seats on that board and we'll advocate for cost efficiency um, as much as we can. It's, I know of, of several other regional water lines and I don't think any of them provide service. They provide water and that's it. That's where the efficiency is had. And they can integrate their sunk costs and costs like their audit or their overhead yeah. into and the cost And that's where of when I, what was really attractive to me, what staff presented was a hybrid model where, yes, we have some plants with similar levels of, and there could be cross training on holidays and things like that. That's where you save the money. You know, your overtime costs or somebody's sick or whatever, you can cross train, you can help out. We will have staff, they will have staff that can help each other out in a pinch. And I think that's, if it can get to that point, in a perfect world, I think that would be the best for everybody. That's, you know. And also, like this interesting, like Donna's motion. Just the first step. We're basically the only, like, it's not being agreed to by the letter of the law, because in that motion, we have an hourly rate and everything else. That, that has all been changed by WRC. So they're not in advance of that motion, right? Like we didn't sign on to the 105, like I, as far as I know, we did not sign on to the $105 an hour uh, the part. And that's, so I, I, I don't see any problem with this motion and the fact that it just puts it into, into perspective that we are now basically renegotiating at this point in, in, my, in, my, in my mind. Can they, we know what the cost effect, efficiencies are gonna be. So, so the, the the letter of the law and the interagency of uh, agreement is no longer sort of there because we're we're talking um, forty and sixty five and eighty five dollars an hour yeah, overtime and right. that kind of stuff and everything's now one hundred and five. So right now the board has directed um, our staff to renegotiate that agreement with the county because that agreement is null and void technically from the board from last year. Was it provided in writing that the agreement was ever terminated by either party? So I wouldn't say it's null and void because well, the only do, way we can get out of the agreement is yeah, in writing 90 days notice and, and from and either I, I party. This is just a, a I realize step. we're not following the right. schedule of service of fees um, and there are some challenges um, with perhaps like procedurally not, like procedures not being followed in terms of, you know, amending the agreement that we're currently in. Um, I can support Donna's motion I ha my only hesitation is I do want to see more information about the cost of water, but I don't think that the motion precludes that because our board members can bring back information as you're working on your budget and it doesn't preclude us from entering into another agreement. It does still leave standing uh, the potable water agreement, if I understand correctly. I think that it's the potable water agreement that provides the water. So that would continue to exist. And then obviously we would be at liberty to negotiate whatever agreements are necessary going forward. My hope would be a hybrid model because I think that does um, deliver this service in the most cost effective, efficient way. And that's my, my goal is cost efficient, safe drinking water for our ratepayers and minimizing the amount that our, sorry, safe, cost-effective water for our utility users, minimizing the amount of those costs being subsidized by our ratepayers in the entire municipality. So as we move towards cost recovery, that will be reduced. That Those are my goals, and I think this motion gets us closer to that, so. And through this whole exercise, I know previous councillors have mentioned that uh, we never knew what our costs were before. We do have a really good number on that now, what it takes to run these facilities. Um, and and we're always moving to find more efficient ways, and this is definitely more efficient. Um, the vast mileage of square kilometers of, of uh, Wheatland County, you know, from where we have two water plants, 
right up against the Calgary, or, um, Rocky View border and need the most labor, and everything's based out of standard, which is so far away, the mileage alone is, is a huge deal. Uh, it's been mentioned at the board from some of the other partners about the mileage costs is huge. So this this will provide clarity and clear up a lot of that gray area, and, and I think so. Any further discussion? Do we have the motion read out again? Uh, so the motion was to direct administration to provide written notice of termination of the interagency service agreement with the Wheatland Regional Corporation. Did I miss anything, Margaret? And then I don't, we may want to consider a second motion following that just to explore, like, then to also negotiate, um, like, a hybrid agreement if that is our hope. Sure. Whether the board members do that or whether administration were with yeah, WRC. We can address that after this motion, it's fine. I, yeah, I don't, want, I don't think you want to leave it sit where it's at right now with the motion, but something further following it would be. Yeah, I think we need further action. So. Um, just Brian's administration again. I think um, I, I still think we council should um, maybe consider rescinding this motion at this meeting and then maybe just putting forward a notice of motion for the exact same motion at the December 1st meeting just so that um, all of council can understand the full financial impacts that could occur. Um, so some exposure that I'm kind of just thinking off the top of my head, just kind of outright canceling this would be just the unknown of the cost of water that could come forward from the WRC uh, per cube. I think that's just something that council uh, should uh, strongly consider. Thank you. One advantage of CAO Henderson's uh, recommendation is we could also include all of that financial information in our council package and then for transparency that's very um, then anybody can analyze that and have a look at um, what we're making our decision based on I'm at council's yeah I, I could uh, agree with Brian on that um, now the wording was to rescind the motion and put a motion on the floor to have uh, the notice of motion, I believe, for December 2nd. Have I got that right? Uh, December 1st, yeah. Oh, December 1st. That would give our board members, you may be able to bring like your current budget as well or Absolutely include not. that in the package. That gives us, I mean, we have a, a meeting coming up here. Um, and we can give all that information that we've been looking at and say, this is a notice of motion. You know, you, if we want to look at lowering costs or we can do this, we can do that exercise if we need to. Or... No, that's fine. So, Donna, you've rescinded your motion? Yes, I rescind the motion and give a notice of motion to be presented December 1st. Any further discussion on the notice of motion? Donna, your notice of motion was your, your notifying of the previous motion that you had made? Yes. Yeah. Any further discussion? Is any councillor opposed? <laughs> motion is carried. We'll move to 2.24, ratify Reeve attendance. Did we want to do a oh, motion with that? I would think that that would follow at that next meeting. We can take that information then still to the board. Yes. Yes, we okay, can take that good. information. Oh, you could do a, yeah, you could direct administration to um, provide the information to the WRC board, um, the Wheatland County no analysis on the three models of service delivery. 
I'll make that motion what she said. So Deputy Reeve Clausen moves to direct administration to provide the financial analysis of service delivery for water in the hamlets of Wheatland County to the Wheatland Regional Corporation Board. It sounds like their administration, your administration has it already, but this will make it public and yeah, that's fine. open to the exactly board. What I want to see. And then that will also be included in our council package for deliberation at our December 1st meeting. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. If I may, um, there was mention too about, we were talking about WRC and I was going to bring it up in my report, but being that Rosebud's coming and going to be completed this year, that pretty much is the end unless Hazard gets on the system. Basically, the reconciliation of debt, I brought it up to the board about reconciliation of debt and how, and I mean, uh, Councillor uh, Kester mentioned a million dollars probably out there, maybe more, maybe less. There is no really motion by our council or any other council out there how that is supposed to be paid. I would really like some direction from my councils to see what this council is comfortable with so I can, when I go to the board, I have something behind me. Um, is it a partnership based? Is it based on, like, uh, it's been mentioned that the county should pay for it 100%. I don't personally agree with that. Um, I think we put a lot of money into this. Um, we have some, you know, we have some overages coming on um, a bulk fill station. Like, there was never really a guideline set as to capital costs, and overages and things like that when it's all done at the end of the day, are we going to eat that cost and just pay for it outright or are we going to figure some kind of else formula? I don't know when we can have that discussion, but I think it's something that would definitely provide clarity. My understanding would be because it's a corporation, it would be debt of the corporation. Like, I'm just trying to think of any other organization one of us sits on as a board member I don't think we would bring debt from that like you wouldn't bring debt from Drumhill or solid waste and just say and the county cover all of it like I'm, I'm just trying to think of we have requisitioning powers right we're set, we're right so that's you're not a corporation so that's not any equip we don't really have another corporation I think if administration, CAO Henderson, I'm not sure if you could investigate and see if, um, provide us some background information. I think we would need background information from the board on what the actual debt is. Um, maybe if we could review some financial statements and. And if there was any previous council motions to yep. how to how to figure this all out at the end, because there's several partners that are there, shareholders, and sometimes it's assumed that the county is just going to pay for all this extra, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, that's why I think our council should be fully brought up to speed on all, what we've promised in the past, what we've put in, and how it's going to finish out. I think there was some discussion around that at the start, but I can't remember what it was about the payback. Uh, yeah, I don't I'm, know. I'm not going to speak to it because I can't remember what it was. But. And that's and I just want clarity. So when I go to the board and this is discussed, I can say, well, we've looked at this and this is where we're at. And here's the motions that support it or don't, or we've made a motion to do this. It just it gives us as board members backing. So would you be looking for administration to reconcile with WRC administration? Find out what it's going to look like. Um, and then we need to have discussion as council as what we are willing to do or not willing to do or what to support or how it's going to work. Because, I mean, that money still has to be reconciled, paid back to either the partners or shares or there, there's just so much out there about how to do it. But it's just easier to get done and over with. So first and foremost, I think uh, your board has a job to, like, review your financial statements and yep. review... Um, where you're at in terms like of, 
Hey, review in terms of what uh, reserve you may have established, what your debts are. Um, I think that would be the first step, and then. And that's. It's not actually. I don't think this council has any jurisdiction on what happens with it. I think the board would need to bring something, if there's some kind of um, request for funding from council. I think your board would need to make that request, and then council would need to consider the request. Well, do we need as, 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 as board men, like if this was promised that the county would, if this is in writing somewhere that the county is going to pick up all the debt, we need to know that, right? Uh, I don't think that was, and I would, I don't think I would have ever agreed to that coming from the area where that I represent because there's absolutely nobody out there that's tied to it. And there's the, the, the mention of partnership and how we're several municipalities are at the table and they've got the grant funding for the most project we've put in the the other part of that the municipal part the county's paid for so then this is at the end of the day who owes what where when why how and once we get that number and, and according to um the board our, our staff have most of that number but i just want something brought to us from what from what brian has so we know what we're getting into we know what we've promised or not promised and if we don't have a decision, make a decision and provide some direction. Because we're they're always looking to us to pay for it. So like a historical review of previous resolutions. Yeah, just, to, just so it's all done properly and, and gives us support, you know. No different than what we've done with the seed plants in the past where we've backed them for this and, and it's all the agreements. Yeah. It's all paid back. Because if you say by, you know, say council says it's 100% the board's expense, that's going to affect your cost of water because it comes a debt. Is it more effective for us to pay for it? Is it more effective for all the pro partners to pay a portion of it because we're all at the table? What's fair, what's not? That's the decision. Made. And just so I understand, up to this point, uh, three years into operations, there's been no debt servicing at this point. And the debt was it's been no thing. If you let me talk, I'm sorry, my phone was was not working. I just got back on, so I probably missed a lot of the conversation. But the money that is owed to the county, it's been reconciled. I believe Brian and Elaine, and it, and it involves Village of Rocky Part Two because that's where the grant money originated from. And I thought it was more or less agreed to that uh, after the phase three was done, Rocky Park and the grant is pretty it's done. All we have to do is reconcile the books and see how much is owed to the county for financing the operation. So the county said they would put in the municipal share, and they said they would also finance it way back when, when the province asked them to, because the province didn't know when they would be paying the money. And after everything was done, the uh, county could charge interest on the money and the province would make payments. But I believe the province is probably very current on their payments. But at least that million or 700,000 always seems to stick in my brain is what WRC is going to be short at the end of phase three. The end of phase three, and when all the numbers are in, then and you know what's going on. No, the province or the county did not say they were going to pick up that debt. All the county said they would do the municipal portion. Council county also put in a couple of plots of water treatment plant at standard for WRC. That, all that money was grant money that was sitting in the Galician Water Reserve. And all that money that was in the reserve, to my understanding, was grant money. And at one time, there was $6 million in change from that reserve. That is the money the county has been using to fund this. It's not been ratepayer money per se. It was all grant money. Reserve now has been closed out for whatever reason. I don't know. So when it's done, three municipalities are going to have to get together 
and decide what's going to happen. It's not a board decision. The board can just borrow the money and uh, get the municipalities to sign. I don't know who's going to, the bank will fund it or not. But at any rate, at the end of the day, it's the municipalities that got to pay for this loan. They'll be paying it through the water rate. And I know for different water plants, uh, Harsland in particular, the county has spent, I don't know how many million dollars upgrading that plant and the pipes and everything else that go lift stations. I think it's up to snuff now. But there was a time there, there was a lot of money every year and the county just paid for it. I think the only debenture that's been put out is Rosebud took one when that plant, when the top blew off the plant, there was a debenture taken out for the residents of Rosebud to pay for that plant. But since then, the county's been paying pretty much everything. Keeping the infrastructure debt free. Now, yeah. moving into the future and council takes a different way, that's fine. But in the end of the day, this money that the WRC has to borrow, I think it should be a discussion with all the municipalities. And they can decide if they want to put money into it or if they just want to have the WRC borrow the money. I don't know what the borrowing of WRC will do to the debt limits of the municipalities. I don't know what it will do to a czar, and they don't even have water. They are a member of the board. I don't know. I don't know what all them answers are. And I believe before we do anything that's different than what we're doing now, it's just being good business and polite to talk to our partners and have their input into what they want to see. And how much it's going to cost everybody. we got some infrastructure there for, as best as good as any place in the province. And we got it for three or four million bucks, or whatever it was. Fifty million dollars worth of infrastructure, and we're, I mean, give it some time. Talk to everybody now that it's in the ground. We'll get the water flowing. That's the important thing. We have safe drinking water. I believe it's a partnership. Thank you for listening. You're probably getting tired of me for sure. No, we always appreciate the information, Councillor Kester. So just to clarify from what I understand, uh, it sounds like at some point Council may have um, agreed to provide bridge funding if there was a timeliness yes. issue with yes, the... We did with the grant funding from the province, it sounds like we need the board to establish uh, what debt there is. For my own clarity, because most grant projects that um, we work on, I understand that this was just over 90%, and it is still rate pay, like ratepayer money indirectly through provincial taxation, but through provincial granting, and then the balance of that but the balance of that was paid by Wheatland County or by the all the municipalities involved in Wheatland Regional Corporation? The county. Okay, so Wheatland we County. No. Wheatland County has been the only one to put in money, and I believe the only money they put in was money from the Galician uh, Reserve. And yes, it's ratepayer money, but it's just as much ratepayer money from the everybody in the province not just wheatland county is what i'm trying to say that money was contributed to by the other municipalities too so yes the county did say they would do the bridge funding and this is the first year brian mason was the infrastructure minister the first year the ndp got in that's when the agreements were made and at the end of the day, it was said that when it was all paid for and done, county could charge interest and the province would pay 
make payments if they owed money, but I don't believe they owe any money. I'm not sure. I really don't know. I don't know how them books are working out, and that was an agreement with uh, NDP, and now we're on to second year of uh, UCP. I, I can't, uh, I don't know. But the county was advancing money for the phase two, and we got our money, and I don't believe the county's advanced any money for phase three, and also the truck fill station, the county's not put any money into that truck fill station, but the money that the WRC had that could have went back to the county, WRC used that money to pay for the truck fill station. I don't think... W, the county's put any money into the truck fill station as per se. This all is for the truck fill station. I think they just for all monies have just been forwarded. And that money hashed. That it money that be hashed. The money that Wheatland Regional Corporation had been holding that is now being applied to the truck fill station. The interest that was being collected on that is going to Wheatland Regional Corporation Board. Yeah, and it goes to pay for the truck fill station. We don't take that money and put it someplace else. Yeah, no, I understand that. that. But it would have been being held by Wheatland Regional Corporation or by the managing partner because it would have been accruing interest in this interim period. So the managing partner. The managing, managing partner, partner and the interest. Truck okay. uh, and the truck fill station, half of it or more, was paid for two years ago. My intent with this discussion, maybe let's bring it to community of the whole. You know, since we'd set one of that up, would be a good part to bring it. Just um, with all this information, looking at the end of it, where we're at, you know, I think that's just a great discussion, and then have some direction from council and support, and then we can go forward. I just I want to get, I want to be able to go to the board. I want to say, look, at, we've looked at everything, and here's the information we looked at. Is there anything different? So we're all, I'm, try, I'm trying to avoid the fighting or, you know, the, the butting heads. I don't want that anymore. I just want to say, look, at, we've looked at this. I have council support. We've done our due diligence. Here's the information. Here's what we're going to do. That's, that's all I'm looking for. So. Well, I think we'll have more clarity at our next council meeting. When everything comes forward, we can consider the notice of motion at that time. If there's further information that you bring from uh, board reports or um, if there's further consideration that council needs to take, we can... Um, bring a motion forward at that time if you're comfortable. I, th I definitely feel like we need more information, so no, that would be good. Yeah. Um, it might be good to put a resolution on the floor just directing administration to do sort of a historical scan of what resolutions uh, Wheatland County Council has made, just so that we um, have clarification around that, um, as long as it's not too onerous um, for administration. I just I know CAO Henderson has said a resolution is always good because then it's tracked and um, it's very easy for us to follow that yep. way. That'd be fine. Okay, then I'd like to make a resolution that uh, we direct administration to do a historical sp scan on on the agreements, any agreements we have with WRC and uh, and the funding and the funding models going forward. And existing resolutions. If What's I that? Could. And existing like. Previous resolutions of council. Yeah, and yeah, that's part of the historical scan would okay. be what previous council has agreed to okay. in pertaining to WRC. Yeah, I think it's important we're aware of that. So, and then we can have that shared discussion too, if there's benefit to that or not, or yep, and make that decision and get it away from the table or on the table or however. Just we got. So. Sounds good. There's a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Take a five. Uh, yes, we'll take a five minute break. We'll reconvene at 11 o'clock. That only took an hour. Uh, good morning. We'll call the meeting back to order. We're going to move to 2.24 ratify Reeve attendance.
Scott <laughs> had a note if you want. So resolution to ratify Reeves attendance at Growth Management Board Rural Caucus meeting in Red Deer October 5th. And is that, or did, you, did you spend the night or is it just mileage? Just mileage. Mileage and time? Okay. Mileage and time. Get with it, man. Sorry, I'm here. Normally, this would be part of RMA, and I would just attend it as part of the conference, but this year we met kind of in the middle, so the rural mares and reeves from Edmonton came down to Red Deer and us from the south went. So this is this discussed Edmonton board and Calgary? Yeah, it's the uh, Rural Growth Management Board Caucus, so it's all the mares and reeves of the Edmonton Metro Board and the Calgary Metro Board. We meet at each uh, RMA convention spring and fall. Typically, we just do it. Uh, carve out some time during the convention. Obviously, we couldn't do that this time. It was a really fruitful uh, discussion. There's notes in my report I can get to next. So, can I ask you a question? Is uh, the Edmonton mm -hmm. Metropolitan Region Board as going along as well as Minister Allard and uh, and he said is it going as well? And it's all sunny and roses. So just for context, because I think not all of council was at the RMA convention, um, I did ask a question at the convention uh, regarding the province's response to the resolution that was passed at our previous RMA convention about dissolution of the growth boards, and just um, sort of a question around Minister Allard had in comments to a previous question indicated, and we also heard this at our district meeting, uh, that failing to plan is planning to fail. And I just countered those comments um, with the fact that a lot of planning does go on in terms of sub-regional planning, uh, municipal planning, and that it's not necessary to have a growth management board for that to occur. I think really strong um, planning can happen and that ultimately um, a question that arises from that comment is do you want the governance of the municipalities in the growth boards modeled after the governance that we see um, it, certainly in the Calgary region, um, by one urban municipality that basically controls the vote uh, due to the voting structure. Um, in terms of the satisfaction of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board, the comments that I have heard would not be consistent with Minister Allard and Premier Kenny's perception of that board. Um, there have certainly been significant concerns raised um, by the rural municipalities in the Edmonton metro region and I think that's certainly something um, that needs to be uh, considered and and perhaps expressed more clearly if that's not um, being conveyed so I know that there are concerns in both regions so and I personally I have some concerns um, with some of the things that I've seen in the Edmonton region they're so much further ahead than we are um, a prime example is their plans for agriculture conservation um, and the methods that they're using to do that. I have some pretty significant concerns around that. So. I don't think we have anything to worry about because Mayor Nenshi has, has gone out and stated how much he, he values agriculture and how they're going to, he wants to keep The urban from population in Alberta is three to four generations away from the soil. And so is their thinking. Yeah. You, you don't think Mayor Nenshi is being 100% honest? I'm strongly advocating for agricultural conservation to stay under the jurisdiction of the rural municipalities that it's Absolutely. in. So we know our landowners, we know the conservation practices that they're already exercising, we know their commitment to that land, and we also clearly understand um, the importance of landowner autonomy and, and their rights. And I couldn't agree with you more when I think of some of the problems we've dealt with with agricultural use, yeah. composting. One of them. Yeah. Just, all that, I could just imagine if, if it was owned by a, a big urban, that might have the majority of the votes that they need, but uh, being allowed to have the control over that would absolutely be a disaster for our residents. Going forward, I do think it is just like a really important advocacy piece for us is for that responsibility to be maintained by rural municipalities. So, yeah, good question. It's I, Back to your question, I don't think the perceptions are necessarily completely accurate about the Edmonton Metro region. Um, there's a motion on the floor. Um, is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Councillor Armstrong, with Deputy Reeve Clausen's wording, perhaps. 
I think you beat him to it. Just got to get him going. <laughs> uh, we'll move to 3.1 Reeves report. It is included in the council package. I will highlight a couple of things. Um, and actually, it's a perfect follow-up to the conversation we were just having. Uh, at our Central RMA District 2 General Fall Meeting, the Alberta Farmland Trust Resolution was approved unanimously at District. Um, again, just uh, th many thanks to our staff and to the environmental coordinator that uh, worked on that resolution. Uh, we did have an education session at that fall meeting on effective lobbying, which I thought was interesting. There was some good information uh, presented there by Alberta Council. Um, it, with reference to that Growth Management Board Rural Caucus, um, there was significant discussion at that meeting and some significant concerns raised from both growth boards from the rural municipalities. Um, obviously, one of the concerns is the voting structure. And I thought it was actually, I think, Mayor Natchu from Sturgeon County raised a really good point that the voting structure does take into consideration population. So in a sense, it's democratic, but it doesn't take into account the voice of the land and the resources that rural municipalities uh, represent. And I think that is a key consideration that is being lost. Um, the rural perspective is often outweighed by uh, urban perspectives and there is a fundamental lack of understanding of rural issues uh, within both of those growth boards. So certainly continued advocacy required there. Um, Councillor Custer's chair will probably highlight it, but I did attend the Wheatland Housing Management Board meeting and uh, just to update council, an expression of interest was submitted for a provincial request. Uh, the province has issued a request for expression of interest. The board submitted an expression of interest uh, for designated supportive living for and 4D, as well as long-term care and community hospice beds. Uh, also notable was the Hospice Soci Society board donated $50,000 towards the architect costs for the design of the um, that architectural work that's being done for the potential lodge project. So a huge thank you to the hospice board for that contribution. Um, just a heads up, and if everybody can share this, there is a group of landowners that are looking at starting up the Wheatland Surface Rights Group again. Um, obviously, as we're encountering uh, issues with uh, oil and gas companies paying their taxes. We're also having landowners that are experiencing issues uh, with oil and gas paying um, their leases. And so there is a group that's mobilizing and working towards that. Um, if anybody needs contact information, just get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with some of the people that have volunteered to sit on their sort of steering committee. Uh, Calgary Metropolitan Region Board, just to highlight from there, uh, we did get a public engagement update. Uh, throughout the month of November, there will be uh, online engagement. So I, we will be doing some messaging around that. And if you can just encourage your rate payers uh, to provide feedback on that. And we also, you'll see in correspondence, we were approved for an extension to March 1st of 2021 uh, for plan completion for the growth and servicing uh, plans. Uh, just to note that the administrative team and the consultant team had created work plans uh, that were assuming a four-month extension. So they're having to uh, scale those back in order to meet the March 1st deadline. Uh, following the board meeting, we did hold the fourth workshop of the CMRB. During that, several concerns were identified, including lack of rural perspective, lack of recognition of agriculture as a major industry in the region. Uh, rural municipalities, again, just reiterating, should maintain that jurisdiction regarding conservation of agricultural lands. Urban leaders do not have the necessary context to control these decisions. Another concern was around feasibility of the plan. The current plan that's being looked at is a transit-oriented design. And so it was raised by one of uh, the board members that given the um, fiscal reality of the situation that we're going into, will there be funding for uh, some of the major transit projects that the growth and servicing plan is sort of predicated on, being a transit-oriented design? Um, so there was some discussion around that. And as well, um, given kind of the dynamic nature of COVID and the impact that that's having on some shifts in real estate and that type of thing, people's um, choices around like lifestyle changes that they might be making. 
Um, obviously, none of that will be considered in the plan. And just to note, uh, they made some really nice graphs of projected growth, and we don't even register on the graphs. We're not even, it, we do not even register. And there are no propose, proposed joint planning areas. So it's kind of ironic because all along we've been advocating for sub-regional planning. So it makes sense for us, for sub-regional groups of municipalities to gather and get together voluntarily. And this has been happening probably since inception of municipal borders um, to coordinate planning. And I know there are challenges with that. There are mechanisms in place to deal with the challenges. Um, but it's actually kind of ironic because this plan is moving towards um, a huge kind of go forward piece of it is these joint planning areas, which is essentially joint or er, sub-regional planning. So that's part of it. We are not in any of the sub-regional planning areas and we have no major transportation infrastructure plans um, out to, you guys could probably speak better than I could, 50 year projections, I don't At least. I saw 30 and there was nothing. 30 years. More, I, I stopped at 30. I resigned at 30. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gang. So, and I'm only providing that uh, for context of really how insignificant we are in the Calgary metropolitan region. So, um, yeah, take that as you will. I, I don't know why you agreed to join Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Um, we had our organizational meeting. I want to thank council. Uh, for electing me as Reeve. I'm happy to serve another year. I am really going to ask everybody to do, try and engage your ratepayers on our MDP review. This is a really um, important document for the future of Wheatland County, and our planning department has done significant work um, in preparing. Um, we did a couple of webinars uh, that were relatively well attended. We had some really good conversation at them. Those are available for viewing online. And there is a survey. The survey isn't very long, um, but if you can direct ratepayers uh, to complete that, I believe it goes until November 30th, the survey will be open. So if you are chatting with ratepayers or on your social media or whatever mechanisms you have to um, kind of encourage people to have their voice heard on that. Uh, CMRB Governance Committee, there was some discussions, there's some concerns that were raised around the ongoing activity of the board and funding. And so administration from the CMRB is going to bring back some principles for using our reserve fund and the board is going to need to make some strategic uh, decisions in terms of how we finance the board. The province has indicated that they will be funding the board to a lesser degree. Uh, I believe the kind of position that was presented to us was it's the municipalities that benefit from the CMRB, so we should be the ones funding the CMRB. Um, so that's just something for us to keep in mind, depending on how that cost breakdown uh, were to occur. At this point, uh, the expenses for the CMRB are typically around $2 million a year. That does include a lot of consultant work for the growth and servicing plan, um, but it's going to be really critical um, in what direction the board takes going forward and how we manage those costs. Also, significant discussion around the fact that we still do not have an appeal or a reconsideration mechanism, even though that's part of the legislation from the province. I think we are getting closer, so where we're kind of at, and I'm open to council feedback on this, is looking at a staged appeal process. And with uh, the majority of appeals would go to a pool of knowledgeable experts to hear the appeal with also an option of a mediated solution. So this is going to be coming back to governance. If anybody has any ideas, open to that. And I believe we're primarily looking at appeals for IREF or once the permanent plan is in place, um, appealing those decisions rather than every single decision of the board. As long as those experts aren't employed within any of the region would probably be fair. They'd have to be some third party, no ties. I believe the discussion and administration can jump in, Matt listened to the call as well, um, would be to pull from the MGB. And so they would be objective third party um, with no ties to any of the municipalities. What appeals to me about this, what appeals to me about this appeal, is that um, one of the proposals was to bring it back to the board. And I really didn't see that being effective. So I like that this is a third party, it's objective, and 
it kind of depoliticizes the decisions that are made. So I don't know if you have anything to add. Okay. Is everybody comfortable with that? This is a huge decision for CMRB because it really does impact um, our appeals. There's been a, a lot of work done on considering different options and trying to find. So some of the factors that we're considering, we're trying to mitigate costs. We don't want an appeal to be extremely expensive. MGB appeals can be incredibly expensive in terms of litigation and the legal um, fees that go along with that model. Uh, we also want it to be timely because we already know that CMRB approvals are extending timelines for development um, approvals and so we didn't want to um, make that any worse than it already is, um, as well as being fair. So if anyone has any feedback, I'm happy to take it to governance and then to the board. At WFCSS, uh, we heard uh, that we had an excellent turnout for a lunch and learn uh, regarding uh, fall safety and fires. And I just would like to pass on uh, thanks to our deputy fire chief, uh, the CAO of WFCS has indicated that his session was informative and engaging and that the uh, Wheatland County resident, or all the residents at the Lunch and Learn really enjoyed that. So I think that's pretty awesome. And then I just provided some information on where we're at with the assessment model review. And I'm happy to answer any questions. With that, I will move my report and happy to answer any questions. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 3.2, Deputy Reeves report. Thank you, uh, my report is in the package. Uh, just wanted to say about the District 2 oh. fall meeting. What? Nope, you're good, sorry. My apologies. Before that, uh, congratulations on DNR District 2 Director being elected, Amber Link. Great to see that happen, but it, we had the fall meeting on October 2nd, and I just want to say thanks to the staff for the hybrid meeting. It was pretty effortless, even with having uh, Minister Allard come in and, and uh, having Skyping or however we did it. it. It worked really well, and people were really happy with it. Um, kind of hard, different, different times, but it worked really well. I saw that in your report, and I would reiterate that. A huge thank you to our, our staff team. The meeting went off with literally without a hitch, and... In these days, that's there's something to be said for that. So from the time you arrived at the hotel right through all the technical was really good. I think um, I would have liked to have had it in our municipality, but like the facility was really good and it was really good to see people in person and have that opportunity to you know, mitigate risk and still be able to engage and network. So it was good. Yes, it was. Thank you to Team Wheatland. Then uh, October 20th, we had a council meeting, and then we had WRC after. And I already briefly mentioned it that uh, at the board, I discussed review of organizational costs and moving forward, which is kind of what operational costs, you should say, which is what I already said earlier today about um, our other sides. And, and we had a notice of motion on that. And then reconciliation of project and debt, kind of just to get that in everybody's heads that. Yes, we're coming up to the end with, with Rosebud. We'd like, my council would like to see it all figured out. Um, budget for the bulk water station, um, just to note, it's probably going to be over budget. Um, there is some, that might be a discussion we have to have at council as to who or what that would look like. Um, the board seems to figure that the county should be paying for it. You know. Um, organizational audit that was discussed and was presented by one of our councillors and did not go over well. I'll let no, leave it for that to say the least, yes. To, to for uh <clears throat> Councillor Kester to discuss that if he wants to. And then with my report I just kinda added I, I asked um administration to to add basically what we kinda look at for the meetings, just so if there's anything anybody wants to ask it's there if it's too much information I won't do it again but some of the stuff with WRC and whatnot it's easier just to attach it so that was my thoughts so if there is no questions I'll move my report as presented I don't mind the minutes being there I won't necessarily include all of them from my meetings just because that will make our packages get really big um, 
if if you can just ensure if you're highlighting anything, like draw our attention yep. to things that um, need attention or focus, that would be great. Fair enough. You know I love reading, but... Just trying to keep up with the yeah. Joneses. Uh, there's a motion on the floor to approve Deputy Reeve Clausen's report. Any questions? Is any councillor opposed? Motion, oh. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. Motion is carried. Um, councillor Wilson asks that his report be moved He'll give his report in next sure. next council meeting because he is in phony or crappy phone country. So that's good. I will just ask for a motion to uh, approve the agricultural service board minutes that were an addendum to his report. I will make that motion. Councillor Eichert has moved. Any questions or discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to Division Three. Hi, Councillor Bigger. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, WC Infinite uh, speakers. Last month were Ryan Corey. He has a. Um, he's an entrepreneur that that kind of invented the e-commerce marketplace that allows online shopping that stays local which is um, a nice concept. The other one was um, Speaker Shea Bird. He's an executive director for uh, Indigenous Tourism in Alberta. Um, on behalf of the Canadian Badlands, we're going to uh, connect. Uh, he was an excellent speaker. Uh, they have a very good plan going forward. So it was very impressive. Um, the other one is the Chamber of Commerce would have finished their strategic plan. Um, I didn't make it to that meeting. And I saw that the opening has, um, or the, not the opening, the presentation of the new um, wording as in Strathmore Wheatland. Uh, it's been approved for the government and there was a ribbon cutting that um, Reeve Link um, attended that I, that I saw and uh, appreciate her attending. Um, the Canadian Badlands. We had uh, a couple engagement workshops, and the one for Strathmore. I'd like to thank Councillor Wilson and Councillor K Kester for being involved. The the report comes back from our um, workshop at the end of this week. They asked questions like, um, you know, what was um, how effective is the Canadian Badlands in your region or for your municipality? And if the Canadian Badlands didn't exist, um, you know, would you be able to carry on with, uh, what would you do for tourism in your area? Uh, the consensus was uh, mostly that they need the Canadian Badlands, that they're, but they're happy that we're looking at uh, revisioning. A lot of the smaller municipalities didn't have any resources other than the Canadian Badlands. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll present that report from the Canadian Badlands um, in my next report. And um, I also want to congratulate uh, Reeve Link for her um, winning of the Division Two for RMA representative. I think it's going to be uh, it's good for our whole uh, region. And with that, I will ask that my um, report be approved. Thank you, Donna. There's a motion on the floor. Any questions for Councillor Bigger? Is any count is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to Division Four. I uh, board is before you on your um and um, I. The thing I want to bring notice to is, or attention to is, um, on October 20th, the WRC, my first meeting. Um, I'm just basically, I'm going to be outlining what I believe are the, are the pertinent to the county. So um, I'm not sure about uh, the the third bullet item, because we need to do a reallotment motion 
for the um, for the 545 that was um, already allocated that money back in February 2017, I believe. Um, there was a resolution, so they have the or, so we counties agreed to fund the the um, the so that bill station uh, to the. Uh, and our share would be 545,000, but there needs to be an a reallotment uh, motion, and I don't know what, how to do that. So I, I did notify Brian that, and I believe he talked to Leah about it. So I don't know what needs to be done. Um, I think it's under 4.43. There you go. Perfect. Yes, we have an it, it, It's in the package. Thank you, and then. Um, I think substantially the line to Rosebud is will be done, so that is good news. I'm thinking that everybody's going to be tied in pretty close to the end of the year, I would guess. And um, there was some discussion about servicing of Redlands, and I asked administration if it was possible for us to share the survey results because we surveyed Redlands, and that was passed on to the board. So, um, yeah, so other than that, I think if you have any questions, you can ask them, but if without any questions, I will pass that part of the. I don't think item one is is a, is a separate item, so I, I'll uh, move my report. Any questions for Councillor Eichert? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move okay, to, so. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. Item number Canada's. one. So I had a conversation. We've, we've got medical, personal medical grow ops in the county, <laughs> and we have no control over it. So I decided to reach out to our MP, and in the last three months, he has gone from, no, we have lots of control to, we have absolutely no control. So what he's looking for is a letter from the county directing just just laying out our concerns about a medical grow up because you can have a, a personal medical for personal medical grow up you can have up to 500 plants 475 or something like that that's a hell of a medical problem and well <laughs> and the thing is so you can have a, a grow up and you it isn't even under your license like i can have a grow up under somebody else's name that i can have somebody else grow 500 plants, 475 plants for me. I mean, so it is like there's, we have no control. Like they would send me stuff and I would pass it on to Matt. Matt would go, well, no, that doesn't work that we We have no control. They, Cause there, there were some suggestions that were made if you make a, on these operations that you should ask the county, the, the municipality for, for permission and all that. But there were no hard and fast things. So I believe what after um, Mark, um, MP Shields finally figured out that was there is no basically controls, and I, he didn't know that he assumed that this there would there would be some controls on there'd be some overriding controls. But because of freedom of information stuff, none of this stuff is it just all the government just says okay we'll give you the license, but we don't tell anybody because we can't. It's you know, you're not allowed to to give out your name and information and that kind of stuff. So I think we should send a letter to um, to our MP in, our, in the, in, probably to all the MPs that, but I'm thinking of Bull River, I, um, Martin Shields, and just, just laying out our concerns about why, like this is not a good idea, like the, the municipality has no controls over this. So that's, and that is what this is, this is about is the fact that Somebody could say, you know, just hypothetically speaking, set up a 500 plant grow up just down the road from myself, and there's nothing I can do about it. And when the neighbors complain to me about the smell and all that kind of stuff, there's nothing we can do about it, you know. So, so the uh, relevance for Wheatland, and I know Councillor Eichert and I have talked about this, both of us within our divisions have instances um, where we've had adjacent landowners report um, what we believe are incidents of this. There's really no way to know. Um, from a municipal perspective, from what I understand, um, what necessarily is occurring. You could even have two medical licensed um, growers growing a thousand cannabis plants, um, just with zero 
kind of requirements around mitigating any impacts from that. So I've gotten some complaints. Um, Tom has gotten uh, complaints. And so um, I completely agree with Councillor Eichert. I think it would be good to send MP Shields a letter outlining some of the adjacent landowners' concerns and impacts that these have. And I'm not sure if we have any ideas about how we might, if there are any solutions to that or things that could make it better. Um, I recognize, so it's really important to make the distinction. These are not commercially licensed, um, either just recreational or medical um, growers, like um, businesses. These are just individuals who can get a license and grow independently. So, I think through the chair, I think before we have, before they legalized all this stuff a couple of years ago, there was not positive of the number, but I'm, it was close to 90 medical marijuana grow ups in the county. Oh, wow. That the county wasn't aware of because it didn't have anything to do with us. How, how can they? They were out there. They were out there and they were, they were licensed and they were medical grow ups and they were, nobody knew anything about them. So it's been going on for a long time. That's nothing new. So why are they being treated any different than any other business, for one? That is because any other business would be that affects the neighbors would be dealt with with the county's power. Well, to play devil's advocate, like to look at it from a different perspective, how you could equate it to, because it is, it's supposed to be for personal use. Now the volumes seem extraordinary, and I don't know that much about the use, but I understand there are different methods of utilizing cannabis where you need large volumes to make smaller volumes of, I'm not sure if it's creams or oils or that type of thing. Yeah, I think the regulations changed after it became legal for these medical grow-ups. At that time, they were restricted to six or eight plants. So what I was going to equate it to is it would be the same as I could grow a massive garden personally, and I could be spreading manure or doing something that would have an impact on my neighbor. So, and we would be somewhat limited, I'm looking to administration, in dealing with a complaint around that if it's like my personal use even if it's having an impact i'm just trying to look at this from different perspectives it, say uh, someone started a greenhouse with three-phase power and all that kind of stuff that would get picked up that way these people are going some on, of these are three-phase yes, power they, they are. They, <laughs> yeah. and i mean it's, 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 it's not it's not something cheap this is million dollar organizations that are going out there and doing it um my other suggestion would be advocating through our because i'm sure we're not the only county that has this problem it's probably Alberta wide, if not Canada wide. This is something that should be dealt with properly. We have the right to know what's going on in our backyard, much like a compost issue we had where we get, you know, we're fighting at the end of it. Why don't we try to get in front of this? And, you know, because these issues, I don't want to live next door to one. I'll tell you right now, if someone had one next to my house and my county didn't do something, I would be doing something about it because I'm not going to have my kids smelling this crap. I'm just cautious because it is a slippery slope. Like when you say we should be able to know what's going on, I think we have to be very we careful. Be well, but I think we have to be very careful about people's liberties on their private property and infringing on those. Do the chairs send the letter and they'll either slap a wrist or send us some information. Either way, you've done your you've okay. done your due diligence and you've asked Prove and somebody will tell you to mind your own business or this is what you can do to my understanding is MP Shields would like this more as background information for himself um, because this is a federally regulated issue. Um, and just so, because initially um, he wasn't sure what the issue was, he wasn't sure what the um, kind of mechanisms were for mitigating some of these issues. We've since discovered there aren't a lot of mechanisms for mitigating the issues. And so it's just kind of providing some background that we are experiencing issues with it. and. I mean, it would re be relatively simple if if you're going to get a medical marijuana, a personal medical marijuana deal, that you have to just, in, oh, instead okay. of just changing words from should to have to, right? That that would be, you know, if you need a DP in order to, you need a building permit or whatever the case may be in order to do this. That's all it would take. Um, and, you know, and then at that point in time, you could say, okay, there's, have to put, you're not going to grow anything 
outside in, in this country, so it's going to be inside. So and put on a biofilter the, on there so that you can, you know, it costs you money. But and that would give the adjacents a chance to have some say about exactly it. Right. All the processes that we're here to do to mitigate concerns, that's the process. Why would that be such a hard deal to do? And I think that's where we have to start. And that's what I think I think Martin wants to do is, is start start that conversation because we can do whatever we but it's all it's a federally controlled substance and there's you know, so we have no control or we you know, so we have to get we have to get the feds on side on this, right? I mean I, I don't know if these people understand what five hundred plants, if you're even just a little bit of a hobby grower, that's a thousand pounds of product a year. A thousand pounds? If you know what you're doing, it's fifteen hundred. The same. You know. I read that somewhere. <laughs> What's the street value of that, <laughs> Council Mark? Well, it's uh, the street value would be well over three million. Yeah. If the That's wholesale the value on it is well over a, a million and a half. I mean, this big money. So it's just amazing that's one, how this that's one, goes that's on. one license. Yeah. So I, I don't know what the le letter should be yet, like, but we know where. I mean. So perhaps a motion. Oh, please go ahead, um, Madam Reeve Council. So I've just kind of outlined a letter that might provide some uh, guidance to MP Shields and maybe some suggestions. So. What I'm thinking is we can introduce the issue. It can be more like a letter slash paper of the issues that we're seeing locally. Um, we can provide those local statistics in terms of what's gone through the pipeline over the last X amount of years uh, through the process, explaining the process that we undertake here, um, or typically throughout Alberta there is a standard process. Um, the lack of mitigating uh, planning and development tools that we're seeing through that process and of course some suggested solutions that we can see that to Reeve Link's point and Deputy Reeve Klassen's point, um, we got a balance kind of obviously we need some of those mitigation tools from mitigating factors, odors, etc. Uh, but also balancing landowner rights as well, which is obviously the trickiest part of planning and development. So we can provide those solutions as well in a letter. My question then, if Council's okay with that, would be um, with a resolution, should we draft one, maybe circulate it through Council for your uh, stamps of approval, or do you want a draft brought back to the next council meeting? I bring it back to our next council meeting. Yeah, it's, I mean, all moves ponderously slow, so. And, and I think once that comes through, I think sharing it with all the members of RMA too, because I'm sure we're not the only ones with this issue. Because once again, rural Alberta kind of picks up on this. I, I can't imagine, can the same thing happen in an urban setting? Like, can you have a house next door to you with a... I, I know of one. Wow. It happens there all the time. <laughs> yes. But, like, I, 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 like how well, do you then know... Well, then should be aware of this, too. Like, I mean, it's all... I mean, it's it's all that not stuff. a good thing. Like, it, it's jumped through loopholes to get where it's at. Now it's legal, and I understand that. But if I was going to have a constituent of mine want to fix cars and upgrade their garage and their, their acreage. There's a process. This circumvents that process. Why would they be treated any differently? You have to look at it more like gardening. But it's not gardening. It is a commercial operation. I mean, when you're talking millions of dollars in product, I can have that argument all day long. And all the risks that are mitigated with it, sorry, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree, it's personal use. Well, and my garden is not typically ever affiliated with organized crime, but <laughs> I mean, it fine, is bigger. Uh, and I, I say that in jest, but I'm not. Like, some of our ratepayers do have concerns around personal safety, rural crime, things like that, that um, I know I've had a ratepayer extremely concerned about safety and the criminal aspect that could be tied to something like that. What if my cows got into it? Can we, and I don't know, this That's is, wrong. I just thought of this, I should have thought of this. Is there any way we can, because cannabis falls under the agricultural growing like of bushes and rose gardens and roses and all that kind of stuff. The non-THC style, yes. Can you, well no, it's, it, this is why it was so difficult to tax a legal medical marijuana facility because or it's just agricultural, commercial, yeah. right? So can we, is there any way you can just take that out of the agricultural thing? Like just that one plant. I don't know if it's, 
if that's no. a doable thing that you no, can't. Because then the next thing you'll be taking this one out, then you'll be taking. It falls under. Well, and I don't care if they take roses. Well, well, we'll go roses and cannabis. <laughs> I'd suggest turn it over. If you want to do it, turn it over to the staff. Let them draft a letter and bring it forward, and then council can review it. And I think you send it to the. If you're going to send it, you don't just send it to the MP. You send it to your MLAs in the in your area, and uh, just let them know what you're doing, and and go from there. And we can share it with RMA too, and the directors could. Yeah. Like we could dig in a little bit Thank and just God. see if other municipalities are. Yeah. I don't have a problem with the producer producing hemp. We've seen that in, in Rocky View. There's been around here. Oh yeah, hemp fun. is totally different. It's a non-THC producing product. This is something that is has THC in it, and by design for medical benefit. So, I mean, it's simple. If it has that, it's a it's not an agricultural product to me. Sorry, it's not. Slippery slope again. Um, we well, grow some of the best on barley thing. in the world right here in Wheatland County. We know where it's going. Yeah, and they're all developmentally approved. No, it's agriculture. Yeah, but it goes into a facility that processes it. Yeah, true. It's good idea, Mr. Aker. I would support your motion. I think it is a good idea to share the letter. I just, it, I do struggle with this because I, it, and GM Boscariel nailed it. It's the striking the balance between autonomy for landowners and private activity on your own land and those, in, and the way it impacts your adjacent landowners. So I think it's good that if we can make MP Shields aware. I like the, uh, Councillor Armstrong's idea of sending it to the MLAs. We could copy it to RMA and just see what we can do with it. So I'll make the motion that uh, administration, mostly Matt, and a letter to, uh, and draft a letter about, and letter slash Report. paper, yep. um, about our, our concerns about personal medical grow ops. That'll come back to us on next council meeting. Perfect. Am I done? There's a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Councillor Kester will move to Division 6. Yeah, hi. Can you hear? You bet. Go ahead. Okay, you have my reports in front. I abbreviated as it is. Uh, I've had numerous meetings with uh, with our community engagement uh, meetings, I guess before the meetings with building committees with the hospice committee for uh, to get ready for our community engagement for the for the lodge with our architects. And I've uh, participated in our last in the last the WRC meeting. Uh, council, if you remember, we said we would uh, we would fund an auditor for the WRC. I presented it to them. There was a little bit of uh, discussion about it. In the end, uh, their CAO was going to get a hold of the auditor and uh, have a conversation with her and get a feeling for her if it's something that. She, he wanted to participate in and bring the information back to the next board meeting and the board would have of course a month to, to think about it and uh, that being said uh, my concern or or my want is if WRC this is their audit their motion their their process they go and want to do this, I would definitely, definitely like to be part of it. I've been on the board, and I think there's only one other board member that's on there from the start. And I would just like to see it through, and I would just like to uh, ask council if they would be supporting of me to be, uh, to, uh, to be on the board representing for these uh, audit-type meetings. 
however forms they take. So I'm throwing that out there. I'd, I'd like to, uh, to be part of that and see this audit through. I think when the audit's done, if it happens, I'm pretty sure it probably will. It'll uh, be a roadmap into the future of the operations of this of this board, whatever that looks like. So I'd uh, definitely like uh, council's consideration on that. Uh, one other thing, the WRC and uh, Council Eichert alluded to it was uh, Redlands and the water that's going through Redlands that was talked about at the board. I've gotten some requests to have a community meeting with Redland. I don't know how many people would come to this meeting. I thought I'd bring it up to council first. And uh, I know staff had phoned them and they'd ask them to participate in uh, surveys and whatnot. But they would really, these, some of these people would really like to have a, a community type meeting. I uh, I don't know. I would definitely like to see it. I'm a firm believer of community engagement, that's for sure. But now in these enhanced protocols, I don't know what that'll look like. That's a good thing that uh, Redland isn't that big of a place. But anyway, I would uh, throw that out there too. And... Uh, Yes, that's all. There was, we had a short notice. It was an Amber's report. Didn't allude to it, though. So Rosebud Center, they wanted to have coffee. They uh, did meet them, Brian and Amber and, and Paul and Bob Davis. We did meet at the county, and we did have a short informal chit-chat. Nothing... Uh, no, no big ass. My question is, a couple of years ago, it's a question for staff, I don't need an answer now, just look into it. Council made a motion for $5,000 a year for Rosebud Theater. I'm just wondering, was that a one year, one time, or was that every year, or, or was there ever a report <laughs> back to council on the proceeds? or the effectiveness of it. Because at the time of this five thousand it was it was said that if they had municipal support it opens up other doors for other support in the world of uh philandering. So yeah, you can just kinda of look that up for me. I'd appreciate that. And uh yeah, with that if there's not any questions I'll move my report. Any questions for Councillor Kester? I just had one question. I just didn't hear really well. The meeting um, with the general manager of WRC, who was she going to meet with regarding the audit? It's, uh, I think it's Endeavor from Hannah. They, uh, this particular individual done a organization audit for Wheatland Lodge years ago, and it was a foundation of uh, what we have today. I, uh, her name was Monica, I believe. I can't think of her last name, but that's who uh, she... Uh, had experience, especially in, in uh, lodges, but she's had other experience in auditing cooperatives. And I believe some sort of, I didn't get the gist of it when I was talking to her, but she's done work with municipal affairs on the same type of relationship aud auditing to, that comes through partners and cooperatives. and. Yeah. Just a concern. I think we just want to be careful 
particularly, I don't know what WRC's procurement policy says, and I don't know how much a potential audit might cost, but I think we want to be very cautious, particularly if the county is considering funding it, that we don't do anything that would compromise our pro procurement policy by meeting, like with a potential, I don't know if administration can advise on that, but meeting with one of the potential, like somebody that might do whether it was like one of the three like verbal quotes or like depending on where it falls in our procurement. It was my understanding that this auditor would be an employee of WRC and not the county. The county was that they would pay for it. But it was WRC's employee or contract, I guess. I don't know how for termination, but WRC and WRC would own the report that comes out of it. That was my impression. Yeah, I think it's I just really key, and I don't want there to be any misperception um, from a procurement perspective, but also from just a transparency perspective with our fellow municipalities um, on the WRC board. I don't want there to be any perception that, like, I want this to be extremely objective and um, Reeve Lynn? Yes. Uh, typically a best practice uh, for an auditor is to put out a request for a quote to three auditors and go from there rather than direct rewarding that contract. And that's, that's where I'm going, just that whether we follow WRC uh, procurement um, policy or guidelines, um, but particularly when we're discussing the county paying for it, I think it's critical that we follow our, our policy and I, it would likely fall in that range where it would just be three quotes. Um, but just that we're very cautious that we don't compromise that procedure. We, from my understanding, we have no motion to support paying for anything right now. We before, don't. No. Before I, we make that decision, we need to know what it is, and it has to follow procurement. Yeah, like a, a scope and. Yeah, yeah. So. And I and I don't mean to take that at all. That would be a Wheatland Regional Corporation uh, directive, and I think the scope and that type of thing would be critical for the WRC board to establish. Um, agreed it would need to come as a proposal to the county. I just want to be cautious, that's all. I guess at the next board meeting, Councillor Eichert and I can discuss with them um, what they've kind of decided, if they want to proceed with this or not, and then we'll mention that. We need to see the procedures followed if not procurement on, on WRC, at least ours, at the very least. Um, preferably theirs and present it to us and decide if we will, we need that information. I, I'm not okay just giving a blank check to say, go, go talk to this person, not, not in any way, shape or form. So I need to see what it is. Yeah, I think we just... If you want more than one, you'd have to find somebody, give you a list of, I don't know how many outfits do this type of audit. I'm sure there's more than this one. It's the only one that I was aware of and that we used them before. But I'm sure it would be a, a matter for board discussion at yeah, the next WRC. Sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions regarding a Division 6 Councillor Kester's report? Just wanted to ask about the Wheatland housing because I'm getting a lot of questions from my constituents. Follow the online public engagement and everybody's asking me, do you have the money to do this? Is this all in place? So what is the board's direction? Do the, is, there, is there funding coming? If not, what is the next steps? Because I get people asking me, everybody thinks the money is ready to go. And I don't understand. You know, I hear um, Minister Allard, I hear uh, Kenny talking about there's no money, no money, no money. So, you know, what happens if there is no money? Because everybody thinks this, the way it looks in the public engagement, it looks like it's not going. So that's my question. 
which we don't have. We don't even know what we're building yet. We don't have any money to build anything. Biggest, our biggest objective right now is this expression of interest. We're successful with this expression of interest. I am been advised by different people that there there's people out there that will fund it. It's a long term mortgage at a very little percent, two percent or whatever. If we just get the 40 beds, then funding is a little bit tighter. But uh, we're not building anything until it's approved by the government. And usually when you get the government approved something, it comes with some funding. In this case, it might be a contract. And if we get the contract, the contract will hopefully pay for it early indications are possible that Avenue will work, but I'm not going to go through the work of, of what it's going to take to pay for it without uh, knowing a little bit more. I know I'm being vague, but that's all I know, Scott. It's, when you get an agreement from the province, they usually give you some money. It's always been the case. If a uh, new way of doing business is with this contract, and then we go out and find uh, lenders, and we use the proceeds from the from the building to pay for it, and maybe some government money to pay for the, the loan. Yeah. So the process is, now that the public engagement is done, we will architects will take that into consideration and they'll take into consideration different pieces of land and we'll do what they call a schematic and it'll be a conception of uh, the future lodge, what it'll look like, how big it'll be how many rooms it'll have, that type of thing, where it probably will be, how much it costs. They just use the uh, province as a figure for each room. It gets so many dollars, hundred and some thousand dollars per room. When the schematic is done, that's the end of our current uh, contract with uh, architect. It's this schematic that we need to uh, take to the province, to the ministers, and uh, present to them. Before we would do that, we'd definitely have another community meeting or two and, and explain to the community what the drawing is and, and what we've come up with and if it's okay with the majority of the people. And we would give it to the minister, and it would become part of their consideration. And yeah, you just sit and wait. So, but that's currently what it is. We're not building anything yet. We've got the schematic, and then it has to be approved by the province. And once it's approved by the province, We'll uh, start looking for funding players. But the architect said that he has funders, and there's been a couple other administrators that they know of funders. And Martin Shields, he's pretty sure CMHC might be available to fund too. They don't give too much money out for free, but at two percent long term, that's. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Glad it's just a question. On the, once the schematic, and I think the timeline was the schematic was supposed to be somewhere around the end of the year, beginning of this year. Are we going to, will we have a, an idea what the 
the cost will be? Will we be able to sort of basic price this thing so that we're going to know what it's whether it's going to be thirty million dollars or thirty five million dollars or whatever the case may be? I believe so. In talking to the architects, the province gives a certain amount of money or they have a dollar figure per room. Like, I can't say I remember exactly what it is. It, I think it's north of $200,000 a room. But that pays for the kitchen and the, everything that's in their laundry, everything that goes in to make up a, a lodge. So you come up with so many rooms, you multiply it by so many dollars, and I think you get a pretty close idea how much it's going to cost. I know this one's going to be a little bit different. We're hoping to put in about 20 uh, independent living suites. They're a little bit different. There'd be maybe a two bedroom, one bedroom. I don't know if any two bedroom ones are being planned. And and the public really didn't have much comment for the for these suites either. So I don't know if they'll even make it into the final final draw. But it'll be up to the board to decide how many rooms they want. And about the time we get that done, I'm thinking that'll be about the time the province hopefully makes up their mind on this expression of interest and how they are going to move forward with that. We're asking for 40 beds. We uh, took the expression of interest and we applied for 110. So I don't know. That's what the province put out there. And we thought, well, we'd make it easy for them. We'll just ask for the whole 110 or accommodate them. So if they want to split it up different ways, that's, that's up to them. Or if they're going to do anything about it. But these expressions of interest were no money attached to them. These expressions of interest come from AHS. There were no infrastructure money. It was a, it was a contract to provide service. And these contracts for SL4s and long-term care, I think they are better than $200 a day per room. So yeah, do the math. So that's all I'm going by right now is, is faith, hope, and, uh, and we'll see what kind of a plan we can come together with the province. When we talked to the province, we had a meeting with them and he suggested 50%. Some places are 30%. We'd asked for 80% on our business plan. I don't know the 80% is that doable anymore. 30% would be quite doable if we got a contract. So it's just wait and see. We'll uh, do our schematic and we'll uh, I know the, there's no money in the province. They tell you that. Then they walk on the other side and say, if you got a shovel-ready project, you got to get people back to work. So we're, maybe we're burning our candle at both ends, but I guess we'll see. We'll have a project for putting people back to work and keep them employed and provide care in the county, too. It's, it's a win-win all the way around. So that's the best answer I can give you, Tom. Thank you. Just one comment, and I made it with my housing board management hat on at the last board meeting I was at, but I'll make it with my Wheeling County Councillor hat on, is just around expectation management. I've had a couple of comments similar uh, to Deputy Reeve Claus and just um, people fully assuming um, that this is a project um, that's being built is the perception um, that people are getting. So. Um, it's been a common theme in my life lately, just around expectation management and making sure that we're as transparent as possible about um, that this is a proposed or a potential project and that the funding is not in place at this point. And I, th I think it's good to um, keep council up to date on what the 
proposed or considered funding models might look like and what those impacts might be on the municipalities that partner for the housing lodge. Um, I know I've had a couple of questions from council and I, I refer them to you, Glenn, as chair. Um, we were not authorized really to speak for the board because the building committee is has been deemed the communication committee. So um, I guess just from a council perspective, we it just will be, I think, easier long term if we manage expectations well and are clear about um, the scope of what's happening right now and what's approved and that type of thing. So. So nothing's happened, nothing's been approved. Uh, the schematic will be the first step, and even then it's it's just a dream. If you participated in the online engage, community engagement session, there was a lot of ideas, a lot of asks, and I'm thinking there's not too many people think all them asks are going to be in the new facility. It's what like brainstorming people put forward their views on what they would like to see, what would be nice. And uh, I guess we'll put it all together and we'll see what we come up with. We build of whatever, every, put everything in the new build is what was in these engagements. Yeah, we'd have people knocking on our doors trying to get in, so yeah. It's a, it's a process. Everybody's conscious of budget money, and money doesn't grow on trees. Everybody knows that, but no decision has been made. Yeah, and I understand but that. The I think it's just... The decision the whole board would have to make, too. It's just not a building committee thing. Yeah, I think my focus right now is just on the messaging and just clear communication with people so that we are managing expectations well and um, I think that's one of our responsibilities. So any other questions uh, for Councillor Kester? That, that expression of interest, just for clarity, that's for operational costs only, that's not for capital building, correct? For neither. It's for our contract. Expression of interest. When we started this a long time ago, our seniors are leaving the community because there's no place for them to go. We approached AHS and asked about more care. And they looked at their, their needs assessment, says, well, Strathmore doesn't need any more. You got enough. And we begged to differ. Their numbers were out to lunch. We had an assessment done, and we were conservative, and it was more than their numbers. And when we went up to Edmonton to talk to John Hebel, ADM of, of uh, AHS, he said the numbers are being looked at. AHS is doing a reassessment not only of Strathmore, but other parts of the province. So on our business plan, we said 40 beds. It was, we didn't pick this number out of the air. We had an assessment done. We got Gary Gordon from Edmonton. He looked at the census, Canada census, and just going through that, he determined that his numbers, and that's what we use to to put our 40 beds in for our ass. So I haven't talked to Alberta Health. I don't know what their new numbers are, but at the beginning of September, they come out with a priority list of 30 communities in the province, 31 communities in the province, Strathmore being one of them, a priority for 110 care beds in Strathmore. So I'm thinking when they've done their new assessment, that's what they come up with. And of particular interest with Strathmore, AHS 
has told about the hospice society here and numerous ones in southern Alberta, there'd be no money for hospice. For Strathmore and the request for uh, for the consideration for the priority case, I think they had four hospice beds also so it's 110 air beds mixed up between long-term care, SL4 and SL4D, and four hospice beds. So that's what we applied for, whatever their assessment model was. So they redone the numbers, and that's what they come up with, and Strathmore was a priority. So no money to it. It comes from Alberta Health. It's a contract to provide this care. You get the contract, then Alberta Health pays you for the care. You become a caregiver. So we'd have the lodge component, and we would have the care component. And the care component comes with so much for the level of care. So with the, the breakdown, I don't have it top of my head. So it's so much the province puts in, so much the patient puts in. And, uh, of course, there's other grants if the patient don't have the money either. So nobody in Alberta has to go out on the streets, as you all know. So it's not for money. It's for a contract. And a uh, contract for care. And the care would be much like home care. So if we were very lucky to get home care plus this contract, that money will go a long way in, in uh, providing a building to help finance it. So just further to answer your question, Deputy Reef Glossen, um, and I think we discussed it previously regarding the request for expression of interest. I believe it stipulated it does not provide capital funding. I did ask at the housing board meeting um, if there had been any analysis of based on the contracted, so it's a daily rate per room that is part of the contract. I had asked if that had been analyzed um, in terms of debt servicing, and that hadn't been done yet at this point. So the board may do that. I am just no. cognizant we do have um, representatives from the bank that had an appointment at 12 o'clock just for signing authorities. Um, if there's more questions, I would just ask that we maybe wait to vote on the report till after lunch. If there's no more questions, we could vote on Division 6 report. I don't want to cut off the conversation. I just, we also have people that are waiting. So if there's more questions, we can come back to this matter after lunch. I'm seeing waves of no more questions. Uh, there is a motion on the floor to approve the Division 6 Council report. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, we are going to break for lunch until 1 o'clock, and we will come back for 3.7 at that point. Sorry, we didn't get yours in, Ben. Uh, we'll be back at 1. I do just need, um, we have to do signing authorities, and also I believe there's a representative coming from the food bank. We're going to do a photo. They would like to thank us for our donation. So. Thank you. You ready, Mackenzie? Good afternoon. We will call the meeting back to order. We'll start with 3.7, Division 7 Council Report. Thank you. <clears throat> what a mouthful. It's here before you. Uh, any questions? The Champion uh, Salem Annual Meeting, we were going to try and have that person, but now it's, it's uh, virtual. That's the only change. So if you want to get in, if you want to see what's going on, you can dial in and and uh, participate. It won't take long. I'll guarantee you that. And other than that, it's just nothing, nothing exceptional going on out there. I'll move my full point. Sorry. Um, just a question on the, like. The, they, they cited this thing now. Like, 
How does the next process go on this thing now? That's what we're trying to get the, the next grant for, is to, to deal with the, pulling in somebody that looks after getting the siting in place and getting the RFPs out. That's a million and a half for that grant. And we're in that process right now to huh? get that grant in place. Borrow money from the guys that are interested in building it and then just... Oh, well, there's lots of them out there with the money, but... Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and and so that... Any on a timeline on how long that's going to take to get the grant? Like, is that from the government you have to get the grant from? Got to get their support to make this happen, and it's a, it's a, it's a government grant. So, yeah, it's through the... Uh, can't think of the name of it now. <clears throat> but... As to when it was supposed to happen, it was supposed to happen five months ago. But because of COVID, everything has been kicked back and kicked down and kicked sideways. And basically, right now, it's a funding thing, and you know what the funding is like out there right now. So if they if they come through that, then we can take the next step. If not, we're up against the wall. Thank you. And then it may go to private. That open up the siting operations again? I have a great nope. place for this where nope. this should go. Nope. We didn't know at the time. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. No, that's all done. That's okay. That's all there. That's it's just who's in control of it. Ah. Okay. So motion on the floor to approve division seven. Any other questions? I guess I should also just confirm. Councillor Kester and Councillor Bigger, were you guys able to call back in? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here too. Perfect. Sorry, I just meant to check that we had good connection. Thanks, guys. Uh, is any councillor opposed to approving Division 7 report? Motion is carried. Margaret, I don't think we need a separate motion for the addendums, do we? I don't think we did that. That'd be great. There's no action from the SEWA attachment, is there, Ben? Just for information, Ben, the attachment on SEWA? We're going to move to... Just before we go, I'll finish, Councillor. I was supposed to have, uh, wanted to mention this in our, in my report. The Cheetah Lions have taken over, or we're going to do the uh, ice and main maintenance of the ice at the Cheetah Rink. So at the last Cheetah meeting, we decided that somebody had to get behind this. So good news and way to, for the Cheetah Lions to st step up. Please pass on our thanks from council. That's a huge contribution to the community. Wrote they're putting ice in. You betcha. Thank yourself when yeah. you're out there. No, really, like all the Lions Clubs do so much for our communities, and that's just one example of how our communities are built on that kind of volunteer work. So thank you. We'll move to 4.1, CAO report. Uh, good afternoon, council. On page 90, uh, 97 of your agenda package is the CAO report. Um, just a couple things to note. There was a couple positions that were being filled um, just due to vacancies, and we did add a position for the Lake from Muirfield Wastewater Hauling. Um, <clears throat> besides that, we've just been kind of following up with uh, council resolutions, and uh, the finance department has been very busy with the budget and uh, really looking forward to the document uh, coming forward to council this year. Any questions regarding the CAO report? If not, a motion to accept his information. I will move. Councillor Eichert has moved to approve his information. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.12. Marigold Library System Requisition. Um. Reeflink, did council want to make a motion to pass uh, the resolution tracker as well as information? 
um, just outside of that report. You bet. A motion. motion. Uh, Councilor Baker has moved to approve the council resolution tracker. Any questions about that? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to 4.12, Marigold Library System Requisition. Yes, good afternoon, Council. Uh, Brian again from Administration. So on page 102 is the uh, RFP for the Marigold Library System Requisition. It's for, uh, it's a two year period, period, uh, fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Uh, we do pay a capital levy, uh, and it goes by per capita. So they are requesting uh, $10.74. Uh, it's nothing new. It's something that we've always budgeted for and paid for. Um, I have included some information from Marigold, um, just kind of what it kind of does and just some library, uh, kind of like uh, almost like a report card for just different libraries in our community. They did provide other ones as well, but I just included, uh, I believe it was just Galician and Carsland. Um, just kind of the services they provide and like what um, the the requisition for the schedule C is actually for. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Um, motion to authorize schedule C. Mm-hmm. Councilor Armstrong has moved. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.13. Yes, Council Bryant from administration again. So on page 122 of your agenda package um, is a business case and an RFB for an additional IT support technician for the county. So during the COVID um, kind of situation as it's unfolded, uh, we've definitely realized that um, we felt like we did a really good job. Um, However, we are also feeling that there are, you know, expectations out there and service levels that we want to meet and we want to try to enhance as well. Um, Our manager of IT services has done an exceptional job at fulfilling every request that he possibly can. But unfortunately, there's just so many hours in a day. Um, and we did really uh, take a look at this position and we thought, okay, like what would this kind of bring to uh, Wheatland County as a whole? So what we're tra- like, we're, we're taking council direction on trying to minimize costs and increase service. And so what we've kind of done is we've began automating services at the county. And so a couple that stick out to me right away are the fire permit process. So what we did there is that we ended up automating this previously very manual process and we think about 400 um, hours of an employee on an annual basis so just not on top of that just on the the actual time saving it's it's also really increased customer service at the county so there are multiple other projects and um, one that I did take a look at just recently before this RFP was um, our safety department so our safety department they definitely uh, improve service uh, policies and um, the, the directives are updated. However, we kind of identified out of five processes that we could automate. We identified 1,800 hours of current manual processes that we could save with a, uh, by automation. And kind of these automation forms, it, it doesn't just save all that time. It also increases potential efficiencies with uh, corrective actions on buildings, um, uh, on facilities, just corrective actions in general. So it kind of, it, it keeps the safety, uh, it actually increases safety as well. Uh, we do want to move to a lot of more automated things. So one thing that we also just automated recently was our utility billing. So our IT manager was very instrumental in that as well. So he's the one kind of working with our software provider to make sure that that works. So what that does is it saves us money on mailing costs. It also provides uh, uh, rate pay or utility account holders uh, an electronic bill instead of the old mailing bill. So it saves on time of the mailing. 
um, the actual cost of mailing and it actually increases uh, customer service as well. So there are many things that we want to automate and we're kind of prioritizing things, um, some with cost, some with customer service, some with just time savings as well. So with all of these things, um, we believe that hiring a junior, uh, an IT support technician would really help that. Um, also, our IT manager, he also just recently, uh, we have hired a new asset management position that's underneath him. So kind of taking away some of these uh, more junior desktop support requests will uh, free up uh, our IT manager's time to focus on managing and implementing these kind of higher, bigger picture processes. Um, so our current IT manager, he'll get anything from a council request, a staff request, stakeholder request, um, to help him. And if he gets some of these requests, sometimes it will take him half a day, um, which kind of takes away from other big projects like the broadband project as well. Um, so what we've done is we've kind of outlined the cost in this RFD as well. So the additional cost of the county on an annual basis would be anywhere from about 100000 to 110000 That would be salary and benefits included. Um, and realistically to us, this is more of just an investment and it's investment in customer service and uh, the county in general. If there's any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Any questions from council? I have just one. Kind of related. It's both the internet. The feds said there's a bunch of money available. I don't know if it pertains to Wheatland County or has anybody even, you know, looked at it or, or do we have that kind of capacity to chase down grants? Uh, yeah, so what I would say is that that's any announcement or anything like that at this point is going to be covered by the broadband project manager. Um, so what we've kind of done is I think it's around a six-month deadline that they're supposed to provide a strategy to administration for our review. And then further, we'll bring it back to council for, I guess, final approval because we, we need further approval for more funding for actual broadband within the county. But kind of any of those grants things at this point would be covered by the uh, the project manager. I think it was Tricon Solutions. I think the, it was awarded maybe two council meetings ago. Any other questions regarding the IT support technician and the proposed addition to the organization chart? Council's wishes. I'll move that the uh, council approve the addition of an IT support technician to the County of Wheatland organizational chart. Councillor Eckert has moved. Discussion? Debate? Well, I think if we, as we learn through this whole situation, especially with RMA and stuff too, the, these positions are critical and helps us uh, provide seamless service. I'm, I'm in favor of that. Well, and just as more and more of our operations rely on technology yeah. too, the responsibilities have increased. So. I think it reaches across pretty much every department, every, almost every operation we do has a IT aspect to it. So I fully support it. Questions? No. <laughs> uh, if there's no other questions, I'll call the question, is any counselor opposed? Motion is carried. I just wanted to say thank you too for the business case and the uh, position description that's helpful in making that decision as well. So thank you for that. We will move to 4.2 Corporate and Financial Services Report. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, 
Reeve Lincoln Council. Um, on page 133 is the Corporate and Financial Services Report. Are there any questions? I have one question, and it's more just perhaps an update that maybe for a future meeting, just some more information about our addressing. I know I occasionally get inquiries, um, and I was really glad to see that um, there is investigation into methods to improve road name accuracy and the third party mapping. That's what I hear more about is the third party mapping with Google or Apple Maps or things like that. Um, but then it also just made me remember that I had had inquiries, I haven't had them recently, but previously about rural addressing. Um, and in the hamlets and that type of thing. And I know at one point, like I know when I moved to Namaka, we used like a street address that was created by the utility companies was my understanding like historically but i think that may now be integrated into county addressing um but i don't know if we have messaged that like if people know that because at one point there was some question whether we would need to change our house numbers or not like things like that so it might just be good to bring that back for public and council information about how like where our addressing is at and what our plans are for it Absolutely, we can do that. And um, we'll also look at communicating to residents yeah. after the information is provided to council. I think for emergency services too, just so that people okay. for sure know what address they should be giving EMS. I know um, if you have a landline, I know, like I believe our GIS has been coordinating um, those, but then if you're calling from, so many people don't have landlines. So okay. I think it's important that we know what addressing we should be, ratepayers should be using. For emergency services. Excuse me, just a comment. I've had a couple of calls from residents, and uh, I've, I assumed that's what it was, so I told them that they were the assessors out doing their job, or they're doing, but they were wondering who these people were with a county vehicle driving halfway up their driveway and then leaving. Yes. Well, I was wondering if there was maybe, I know we know we sent out notices that the assessors would be going out, but if if maybe when they pull in the yard some, and somebody's around there, they just maybe roll down the window and say, hi, this is what we're doing, or just leave a card or something so that more so when there's somebody there and they don't get out, they're wondering what they're doing. That was that was their question. They were happy when I explained that they were, the assessors doing their inspections and they have to do it on a regular basis, but they were just curious as to why they drove in and left. So. Okay. Thank you for your feedback. I'll pass that along to our assessors. Um, so in that case, they would be stopping taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And especially because of COVID, we are being more careful than previous years um, about knocking on doors and things like that. But I will still pass that along. Any other questions for corporate and financial services? A motion to accept the report as information. So moved. Deputy Reeve Clausen has moved. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.22, capital spending update. Good afternoon, Reeve Link and Council. My name is Matthew Kersiba, Manager of Financial Services. I'm here to present items 4.2.2 and 4.2.3. Firstly, I'll be presenting item 4.2.2, capital spending update, as at September 30th, 2020, which you may find on pages 139 through 134 of your agenda. At September 30th, 2020, the capital spending totals are substantially below budget at around 42% of budget. An important metric to note is that for all projects marked as complete, actual costs came in at only 96% of total budget. This rep represents a 4% savings on completed projects. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions regarding the capital spending? If not a motion to accept the report as information. <clears throat> so moved. Councillor Armstrong has moved. Is any councillor opposed? <clears throat> uh, 
Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.23, unaudited financial statements for Q3. Good afternoon again. I'm Matthew Perceba, Manager of Financial Services. Secondly, I'll be presenting the item 4.2.3, unaudited financial statements as of September 30th, 2020, which you may find on pages 145 through 149 of your agenda. These are prepared by internal staff on a quarterly basis. Please note that budget has been calculated on a monthly basis to reflect expenses where applicable. I'll begin by discussing the statement of financial position on page 148. Cash position is on par with the prior year. This cash position is reflective a month after our 2020 August 31st tax deadline for 2020. There's a substantial increase in taxes and grants in lieu of taxes receivable. Uh, this is mainly due to the economic impact COVID-19 has had on county ratepayers. Trade receivable is down. Uh, this reflects a payment um, from the WRC. Uh, accounts payable is up. Um, this is due to the education requisition payments um, being higher than in the prior year due to the non-residential portion of the June and September 2020 quarterly payments being deferred until December 2020 um, due to COVID-19. Deferred revenue is down. Uh, last year's deferred revenue was used on capital projects. Once deferred revenue is used, the, bal the balance goes down until we receive further funding for future projects. Next, I'll be discussing the statement of operations on page 149 of your agenda. Revenue looks in line with budget. Total operating expenses are significantly, significantly lower than last year by around $4 million. This is due to measures taken by the county to decrease expenses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Besides that, everything is in line as expected. Thank you. Any questions regarding the unaudited financial statements? Uh, I got one. Our operating expenses are down four million because is that mostly in wages from all those people we didn't uh, bring back to work? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, so um, there's some factors that come into play there. There's overtime reduction um, and salaries being um, the biggest ones there. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Kester, just to add to that, Brian, from administration, there's going to be some other just very unique things in there. Um, so 2019, 2020, just so different. Um, one big one is going to be just like training in general. Um, a lot of training just kind of got put to the side this year, uh, not because just staff didn't want to do it, just because a lot of them were just either not offered or deferred, um, lots of conferences and things like that. Another big one, actually, that is, like, fairly interesting is uh, fuel costs. So I think it was right as COVID hit, I'm going to say April, May, um, prices for diesel and gas just went down, like, very low. Like, I'd say down 50%. Um, I like. I think at some points in just regular at the pump, it like regular gasoline was like fifty cents a liter. Like that's something that we just could not have anticipated at at that time. Um, it hasn't slowly gone up a little bit, but not to the levels it was in twenty nineteen. So just kind of some of those factors as well, um, on top of the overtime reduction and uh, I guess staff reductions as well. Thank you. So I'm thinking when you're doing the budget now, you're looking at. Uh Restoring some of the services that were cut, the construction crew and whatnot. That's, that's always been a, what the county did, and uh, we cut we cut back so hard. I'm just wondering, curious, if we'd be able to restore most of them services, or now we've got a better handle, or or some of them anyway? Uh, we definitely could. Um, that would really be at the will of council. Um, so I guess in our upcoming budget discussion, I think it's scheduled for the 24th. I, I know we just scheduled today, but I think that would probably be the best time to kind of chat about just service levels and kind of what council wants to do with the other funding and kind of things like that. Okay. Sounds good to me. Thanks. 
Any other questions regarding the unaudited financial statements? If not, a motion to accept his information. I'll make that motion. Councillor Eichert has moved. Any further discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.31, Community and Development Services Report. Good afternoon, Council. Matt B. from Administration presenting the Community and Development Services Report for October 2020. On page 150 of your agenda package, uh, you'll see the several divisions and the updates that we provided for them. But noting, notably, um, I included an addition to this report. Just there was some interest and we had discussions about the Badland, Badlands Recreation Development. So you'll see just an update there that we received in October, um, October 21st specifically. Um, the Environmental Appeal, Appeals Board has scheduled an appeal to be heard on December 7th, 9th, and 10th. The appeal is going to hear the submissions with respect to the decision of AEP to issue Water Act approval to the Badlands Rec Development Corporation for infilling two wetlands, modifying three wetlands, and constructing, operating, and carrying out maintenance of the stormwater management system. Uh, the hearing is not going to be open to the public, but individuals may request a copy of the audio recording. So that's just a specific update for Council's information. Should we receive additional information, I'll certainly circulate it to Council or provide it on our next or future uh, department updates. Uh, for community services, obviously we're continuing to monitor the COVID-19 updates with respect to our public facilities and spaces. Uh, the Speargrass Rec area site was seated and most of the work is complete uh, in that area, including the playground. So we're looking to schedule a photo op there in terms of celebrating the achievement um, locally there. We're reviewing the engagement materials for the Open Space Rec and Culture Master Plan. Uh, I circulated a note to Council with regards to, we kind of delayed it just with re respect to the season, so we're going to pick that up actually very shortly uh, and continue that engagement process. And the site prep for the Lakes of Mirfield, the ground leveling, all of that uh, was completed. Draft agreements for the outdoor rink site were signed, so quite exciting. So we're moving forward with that. Uh, with respect to economic development, a uh, huge achievement on that end, the Small Business Week, we hosted our own online conference. Essentially, we planned it, uh, hosted it from October 18th to, 20, uh, to the 24th. So that was a, a huge success. In addition, the community profile were being marketed uh, locally through Calgary and Edmonton region, 60,000 impressions that we received there. So we're really pushing that. So that's exciting as well. With respect to fire and emergency services, you'll see all of the actuals, uh, the statistics there. Uh, one note that I didn't include in this report, but we're going to include in future reports is ongoing monthly updates with the Carsland Fire Hall and the capital project there. So we want to include basically um, kind of a Gantt chart. I have one uh, updated right now in front of me, but uh, it wasn't included in this one. Where we're at is we're concurrently going through the building permit process and getting the site Built permit process is ready to go and towards the end of November uh, we'll do the you'll see some equipment there pretty much in terms of shovels in the ground or what have you I'll circulate a note uh, throughout November to council just to keep you guys updated and then our next monthly report will bring something forward so that we'll continue that ongoing uh, kind of project management with regards to that and you'll see on page 152 we've included updated dispatch calls by fire hall that's a new statistic that you'll see in these reports moving forward in addition, planning and development, uh, as Reeve Link mentioned in her report, uh, we hosted the second Municipal Development Plan Review webinar on October 21st. Huge success, some, uh, some great questions, uh, and we promised to bring back a what we heard report to Council in the near future, so we'll move forward with that. Concurrently, we're working and we're engaging with several divisions in the county. Um, hearing that feedback from all the experts that we have uh, internally at Wheatland as well to get that information. And you'll see the actuals for planning, uh, development and safety code permitting. Um, no uh, deltas that stick out to me considering the year we've had. And then on page 154, you'll see protective services and reports completed for September. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for community and development services? I have a couple of questions. Uh, with the Badlands Recreation Appeal Hearing, would it be relevant, given that we submitted a letter of concern um, 
Prosec as a municipality to request a copy of that recording? Uh, to Madam Reeve, yes, absolutely, we can do that. Okay. And then I don't know if just sort of a summary might be able to be provided to council. I know it's been an ongoing concern for that area, so just to follow up from the letter that we had submitted. Certainly, I can include that as a, an item in the report as well, okay. in, at future reports, whenever that may be. And then my second question, I love that we're seeing the fire calls again. That's helpful, I think. I don't know if it would be onerous to break down uh, the number of calls that would be co-responses um, or mutual aid versus sort of distinct events, just to give us a sense for, do you know where I'm going? You're nodding Ab your head Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. So this was our first go around with the stats. And so we're actually maturing the way we take stats in. And so actually I had this conversation with Chief, Chief Borgon I think yesterday, and so we do intend to kind of split it out even further to provide that that data for you guys, and we'll be kicking off January uh, 2021 with some new information and way we gather data. And, yeah. and have what are we doing with co-response right now with the town of Strathmore? Um, or if so, you want to bring that back to yeah, you with that, absolutely. I'm not sure where we're yeah where we're at, but I don't know if anyone else knows. More. <clears throat> I know from the bridge, we were doing it all the time, and then it was supposed to stop. So, yeah, after the bridge was done, might not be bad just to bring an update to council back on where we're at with that. I know there were some. Con I had heard some concerns just around like most efficient fire service, right? So, certainly. Any other questions regarding the report or from this department? <clears throat> If not, a motion to accept the report as information. I moved. Councillor Armstrong has moved. Any further discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.32, Development Permit 2020-114. Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Hayes, Development Officer with Wheatland County, and the application before us is DP 2021-14. It is for a variance to the rear yard setback with an encroachment onto the existing utility right-of-way. It's in the lakes of Muirfield. So if you go to the location plan on page 165, Appendix A, you will see where it is within the um, lakes of Muirfield there. Kind of hard to see up there, but... Uh, um, and if you go to Appendix B on the same page, this was our circulation map. We circulated to adjacents plus one. We didn't receive any responses. We did also circulate to the Homeowners Association. They had no concerns. Um, there is a 10-foot setback in the Lakes of Muirfield right now to the rear yard, and that was created in to be in alignment with their architectural controls at the time, so it wouldn't be confusing for homeowners. However, they have advised, they have no concern that they've actually revised their architectural controls and they will send us a copy once they're finalized. And just as a side note after that, I think we're going to have to do a, a land use bylaw amendment so that we are in alignment again. In all the other hamlets, we have a four foot rear yard setback, I think, except for in Speargrass. So they are okay with, uh, with changing that. Um, internal staff, um, Public Works is okay with the variance. Um, they had gone out there and done a site inspection and had determined that we will likely not put a drainage swale within that utility right of way because the grades used to build the three existing homes will not easily be adjusted for a swale at this point. So it's doubtful we will ever construct the swale there. Um, a planner was concerned with the encroachment, but she said if Public Works is okay with it, she is too. And the fire chief had uh, reviewed and had seen no reason not to approve the variance from a fire perspective. So not only was it on encroaching onto the drainage, the utility right of way, but it was also too close to the rear property line. If we go to the aerial photos on page 166, um, appendix C and D there, 
You can see at the back is the utility right of way. And if you just scroll down a bit, Mackenzie, there's, um, you can see the yellow, that's the swale. And then those two squares are the buildings. So you can see where they're encroaching. So after public works had determined the swale will never be constructed, um, there was discussion about can we just discharge the utility right of way from the title altogether. But checking with land titles, it was discovered that it's a blanket caveat and it's placed on many, many lots in the lakes of Muirfield. So to discharge the caveat, we'd have to discharge it from all the lots and we don't want to do that. So we're not going to discharge the caveat. However, Public Works no longer feels an encroachment agreement is required. So our policy evaluation um, on page 167 and 168 are photos, and I'll just go through the policy evaluation while we look at the photos. So it does not align with the MDP and the LUB with regards to encroaching on the drainage swale. However, Public Works has advised it will not be constructed and has no issue. Um, it does not meet the setback of 10 feet from the property line, nor will it meet a potentially revised setback to be 4 feet. However, the fire, Deputy Fire Chief has no issue with the reduced setback from a fire perspective, and neither does the Homeowners Association. And we did not receive any concerns from adjacent landowners. So the conclusion on recommendation on page 159, staff are recommending approval of the variances and had originally recommended condition number four, that encroachment agreement be signed. However, we are recommending that condition number four be removed from the conditions. So on page 163, we have the three options that MPC accepts or approves the recommendation as proposed. I'm not sure how that should be worded, if it should say as amended, and then the other two options that are standard. And that concludes my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Council Swishes. My only concern is, I know there's no drainage swale there now, but usually with that overland drainage, the roads kind of graded that way. So if they get a heavy rainfall, that is that the case there? I can't remember. But I've walked it before, but just want to make sure if we get a heavy rainfall, we're not going to be on the hook for flooding somebody out. So, so through the chair, we did review this in the public works, and as, as Suzanne mentioned, there we had. Um, I'm not sure if we have some site photos in the, in the report here or not. Yeah, there's some. Um, just kind of see the existing lay of the land there and, and see how the, the landowner has built up the lot there. And we're anticipating that the, the other lot, one of the sold, will, will be constructed the same way. Um, <clears throat> there is going to be some drainage that still goes to the southwest um, off of that lot into that low area. So it really will be very minimal drainage going onto that road. I know that the, you're right, stormwater management plans are designed all around a, 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 an overall system, but this is a minimal <clears throat> drainage change that we don't see an issue with. Well, I'll put a motion to recommend recommendation from an administration uh, with the change of number four. Presented. A motion to approve the amended DP omitting condition four. As presented. Any questions? Discussion? Any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to 4.33, annexation of former school lands, Village of Hazar. Good afternoon, Council. Matt Buscariel from Administration, uh, presenting the annexation of former school lands, Village of Hazar, southeast 1424th, 20 west of the 4th. Uh, in the report on page 169, you'll see all the history just kind of condensed uh, with regards to this entire process. And more recently, in Ju June and July of 2020, uh, 
You will recall that we did reach out and inform Golden Hills that they can begin the transfer of land with the village. Now that that process has been completed as of October 8th, uh, the land must be officially annexed by the village of Hazar. So you'll see on page 172 of your agenda package the letter from the CAO of the village of Hazar requesting the annexation, um, just council's permission with regards to authorizing the beginning of that process. Secondly, that council permit the village to discuss and refer to the annexation of land in its municipal development plan. Just by, back, by way of background to that second part of the motion, they are actually um, developing an MDP right now. And in that MDP concurrently, they'd like to um, refer to this parcel of land just with the anticipation that the MDP might come before the annexation process, which can be quite lengthy. So there's a two-part motion just by way of background uh, for your consideration. That concludes my presentation. Thanks. Council's wishes. recommendation. Councillor Armstrong moves the recommendation. <clears throat> Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to 4.41, Transportation and Agriculture Report. Yes, thank you, Council. Um, on page 174, is Mike with administration speaking? Um, page 174 of your package is the October Transportation and Ag GM report. Um, just some highlights. We're, we're obviously in full winter swing here with our, our operations. We have our five plow trucks operating and, and the greater divisions clearing as, as need be. Um, we also have a, a contingent of, of Hamlet vehicles that go around and spread, spread, uh, spread sand and, and clear snow in the Hamlet. So those have been really nice additions for the, the crews we had done it previously with just uh, a grader and traveling between them. And the responses from this we get with these trow, truck, uh, plow mounted trucks is, is quite quick. So we're quite impressed with that. Um, just some highlights. We were. Continuing on with some culvert work now that the the road construction is completed, um, working on some culverts on <clears throat> Range Road 240 and uh, a, uh, another road slump that we found up near um, Rosebud. So those are jobs that the crews are working on right now. Um, speaking with the, the road slump in Township 272 and, and Councillor 7 Division, um, we have been monitoring it for quite a, a few weeks here. It seems to have stopped slumping, um, settling anymore, so we're going to watch it a little bit longer than repair the road and hopefully um, watch over the winter if it slumps anymore. We'll, we're already t anticipating um, going out there in the spring and, and um, extracting quite a bit of soil to, to find the root of the problem on that. So it's a much larger job than we at first anticipated with that repair work on there. So. Um, yeah, other than that, that's my report. If anyone had any questions, I'm here for an answer them. Any questions for transportation and agriculture? I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, just with the three ASB bursary winners, I was just wondering if we might be able to announce that. And I don't know if we have permission, but to share like a little bit of their bio. Maybe we did it and I missed it, but it might just be good for even awareness of the bursaries just to like do some PR with who won and the amount that was awarded and that type of thing. Definitely. So <clears throat> council's thinking um, something on the websites and, and that's yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, the Maybe website even... and social media. Yep. I don't know if we have permission Great. with the bios they submitted, but if we could just do like a brief, you know, what they're studying or mm -hmm. that type of thing. I think it's just one more way to get the word out about the bursaries. Definitely. And the incredible young people that, you know, we have in the county, so twofold. Good idea. Any other questions? Yep. Just a clarification on facilities. You had some unit heaters at Lakes and Merrifield and other building repairs. What building would that have been? Um, I believe that is the Mercantile building. Yeah. I believe there was a little bit of, I know, I know our facilities guy has been up there quite a bit with, with, uh, 
I mean, yeah, truthfully, a lot of things have not been maintained that we're finding all the way through the utilities, all the way through the infrastructure, and now we're looking at the buildings. Okay. Um, I think everyone knows we had a $75,000 raw water line repair within a month and a half of taking that place over. So there's, there's a lot of things that haven't been upkept, and we're going to be uncovering these over the next couple of years, I'm, I'm sure of it. I'm not so, surprised. Yeah, for sure. Happens. Yeah. Good that they're being discovered though and fixed. Yep. Yep. Good, in no. good hands now. People are very happy. On a question on that, like all those repairs of that, is that all coming out of that Muirfield revenue? Like the revenue the fund? The sale of lots and that kind of stuff? Mm. Um, so through the chair, it is all being accounted back to the contracted services code that we've set up for that. Um, how it's reconciled at the end of the year, I guess, is we'll have to see as we are selling lots there. Um, that'll pay for some of it. But uh, I think I mentioned that we are probably about four and a half million dollars in uh, infrastructure debt with what's remaining in there. So the lots will not pay for all of the, the repairs. Or lots it will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's a price. laughs> Any other questions? Not a motion to accept the report as information. So moved. Deputy Reeve Claussen has moved. Any further discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We'll move to 4.42. Rosebud ratepayer water line connection. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so through the chair on page 179, uh, this RFD is regarding a Rosebud area ratepayer water service. Um, I guess some direction towards how council would like to, to handle this. Um, so, so I guess so for some, some background on this request here, um, as everyone knows, we're fully into phase three servicing of, of Rosebud community with regional water. Um, this Rosebud community had uh, historically been serviced with three high quality groundwater wells located northwest of the community. Um, I think there's actually a, if you can scroll down, Mackenzie, there's a, an actual figure that kind of shows the layout of the um, current water servicing. So uh, in the, the northwest corner there is the groundwater wells. It travels through a, uh, an easement on private land there um, down to the road allowance, the, uh, the east-west there where it splits from red to blue. The uh, blue continues to the east and goes down into the water treatment plant, um, which is just northwest of Rosebud on top of the hill there. Um, so when this service was first installed, I believe in 1988, or so, um, there was a an agreement with the landowner uh, of that residential parcel shown in the corner. Um, basically, uh, I, I believe that the landowner owned the land to the north here, and it was part of the agreement that you give us the easement, you agree to this, and we will uh, service you to a point. Um, the agreement was put in place actually very specifically for that landowner and no um, future landowners of that property. Uh, but regardless, that had continued on after that landowner left and through two subsequent landowners that lived there. Um, so that landowner has been paying towards the, the it being billed, being metered, uh, paid for the debentures and rose, but paid for the capital levies, all that sort of thing. Um, so now, basically fast forward to putting in the phase three regional line and that service line connection is no longer required and as such we actually have to decommission those wells as part of our approval in commissioning the new regional plant. Uh, or at least that was what our intent was and that is what we've been um, discussing with Alberta Environment on that. Um, so that in effect um, disconnects this ratepayer from that service and um, um, takes away his uh, water, potable water service. Uh, so we have been in consultation with, with this repair for a number of months, ever since we started, and even prior to it was this landowner only bought this land a couple of years ago, but the previous landowner, we were discussing how this would happen if, if the connection happened. Um, and so I guess we're at a, a point right now where, say, phase three connection is probably 
done early December. Um, the site will have to be either continue to be uh, temporarily serviced by the county, um, knowing that we have a six month commitment to decommission these wells with Alberta Environment, at least have a plan on how we're going to decommission them. Um, so there, we looked at a few different options with the landowner here. We looked at, yeah, pushing with the agreement and, and what's in place in the past and, and eliminating the service. Um, we don't think that's appropriate because this has been, like I say, a rate payer that's been paying towards the, uh, the servicing and debentures and all that sort of thing in the community. Um, some, some options we've looked at, we've acquired a quote to service that rate payer off of the regional line. Uh, I believe it's about $12,000 to service the regional line uh, up to the property line, install a meter vault and, and that sort of thing. Um, that is only up to the, the property line and, and the service connection from there. Uh, we're we're under one aware uncertain of the condition of the, the service line that goes straight into the property and how far it goes, um, quality, condition, that sort of thing. So. I've put in a quote here on, on $12,000 for servicing, but I'd say we can anticipate maybe a $25,000 max if we have to go in and, and install new piping right up there. This if we're going to service all the way to the, the house, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I guess I've given the council a couple of different options here on, on which direction um, you'd like to give for, for servicing this property, if any. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll leave it up for discussion with council from here. So we had discussed this at WRC board meeting because uh, um, CEO Henderson brought some information about the, the billing and stuff. I never realized this customer, we'd been billing him for a, for a while. Mm -hmm. So as far as WRC's concerned, this would be a county customer because the billing came from the county prior. So they don't... Like they, a they, hamlet? They, yeah, it's basically would be part of the hamlet. So that's the thinking from the WRC board, which I don't really disagree with it because we had done the billing prior to WRC bill being there. So the other thought was, and there was discussion about the service to there, so I'm assuming that property has a meter already and we should just treat them like any other customer and go to the property line, put a curb stop in and provide service. And if he needs a meter inside there, that's would be his. And if the, and if the line inside, um, the property line is not good enough, that's really not up to us to fix. That's my personal feeling on it. Um, the, the line from WRC does go right in front of that property. Mm -hmm. So, and it's gonna be treated water and everything. I think the pressure range is, Tom, what did she say it might've been? 180 PSI or something, fairly high? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the engineer said that uh, they thought there was enough head pressure there that the system should they might need a pressure reduction yeah yes. exactly yeah so i don't know i i basically asked um mpe to get a hold of you and give you some pricing on it yes so i don't know if they have or not um uh, yeah no sorry through the chair they have uh, like i say given us the the uh, to the property line and then we've kind of estimated past there what our cost would be if we because i mean they, they've with that kind of pressure and stuff there there's going to be they're going to see if there's enough demand flow for that mm -hmm. if it would affect anything of course it depends on the, the the size of the service too like i could see if it was a a poultry operation or something like that <clears throat> pardon me needed a lot of water it'd be different but this is one service so whether or not a cistern is appropriate or not the engineers were supposed to right wasn't that right Tom? yeah they, they, i think the cistern was the sort of the, the last the last resort the last resort they well, they're hoping that and the engineer thought that there should be plenty of of head pressure um, just a question. So we supplied this. We've had we charged for it, which is, and they, but he was. We were supplying untreated drinking water to this operation because there's not a line coming back from the water treatment plant back to his place, right? There's no way. That's raw no. water. Uh, yeah. So through the chair, like uh, this is basically it's chlorinated up at the water wells. It is chlorinated oh. all the way through. Um, yeah, we don't provide testing at that site. Uh, it is a little similar to uh, with the regional line and the region, the rural customers that we have. We don't provide testing to all the, well, I guess it's WRC's line to begin with, but they, are, they don't provide testing for each one of their rural customers. It's uh, chlorinated at the, at the in inception of the line and it's, it's 
test it at the, the end to make sure the contact time with the chlorination is, is appropriate. But what happens between there is, uh, is um, not verified. I, I was just a little bit concerned. I'd love to see this operation. Because if we're sending them raw water down that line and charging them for it, I'd hate yeah, to see no. the, the liability down the road if somebody were to get sick off of this. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council's wishes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. I think I was on mute. Yeah. Uh, there was talk of putting a vault at uh, right at the line at the end of the driveway. Uh, probably a pressure reducer. I believe there's a meter. I think his meter is in his yard. And there's a county line going. Well, you can see it in red there. That was a county line put in when they put in the waterworks. They put a pressure reducer on it and reduce that head pressure down from 140 pounds or 80 or whatever it is. Sarah was going to look at it. I don't foresee any problem with that water line going into his yard. That we wouldn't be replacing it if there was nothing else. It's the same line that's going to all the wells and everything else, I'm sure. So I think the, the issue is put a vault in, put a pressure reducer in. I would leave the, the meter where it is because that's where it always was. That's what he's paying for or did pay for. The problem will it, of it being these county counts county customer is that WRC collects its money from water delivered to the Clearwell. Our system meter reading meter is not going to be to a Clearwell. It's going to be that. So it'll be one extra meter, one more meter WRC will have to read and add it on, I guess, to the county bill is the only difference and he could remain a county customer. So I'm thinking if we just put a vault in, we'd have to put the vault in at the end of the driveway so we can reduce the pressure from that line so it doesn't rupture any uh, any current piping that's there. So I, I don't see a problem with that. And then the nice part of it is if it does rupture, there would be a shutoff valve at the property line, and, and of course it can be fixed, and it's not uh, jeopardizing any of the WRC main lines. So I don't know if you're looking for a motion that the county uh, install a vault and a pressure reducer and hook on to that uh, existing pipe, and you can shut off the other pipe going back towards the treatment plant. All that line would be off, but we could still use that line going into his, uh, I'm not sure if he has his meters in his house or if it's in a, I'm kind of thinking it's in a different place, but I've never seen it, to be honest with you. But that way it'd be the least amount of disruption. He's a, he was a customer, he'll remain a customer and through no fault of his own, uh, the service has changed. So just treat him like any other customer in Wheatland County. Quick, quick, just a quick question mm -hmm. on, because this um, customer is going to be outside, we will be using the, uh, we could still send for what, reading the meter on that particular meter. We could still use whoever's going to be reading in Rosebud, right? Like if we take that on. It'll be a radio read meter, for sure. Right. So you might even pick that up from town, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. That shouldn't be, that shouldn't be a big deal, right? The meter reading shouldn't be a problem, no. Okay. 
Um, through the chair, like I said, I, I guess it is the decision. If, if it's our intention was that the the connection would be made, um, and then uh, for ease of, of process, that it would become a, a Wheatland regional customer rather than a Wheatland co county customer. Um, looking at the flat rates, looking at the current um, uh, per cube rate here. Uh, we are very close to, to cost comparison on that. I think it's uh, five or ten bucks more a month to be a WRC member with the same usage that he had on there. Um, this way, it would be the county would have to uh, be invoiced for his service and then invoice back through that. So it's a little bit more well, convoluted, but and, and we can go take it back to the board too because there is the fact that right now, as a customer, is not being charged for the wastewater which is a, set aside as unique already from the start. So hmm. if we get provide the hookup and WRC does become the WRC customer, we can discuss that at the board. It makes sense what Glenn said. Mm -hmm. Like, we're, you know, WRC basically provides to the player well, so. Well, <clears throat> through the chair, if I'm reading this right, we have to make him whole again. So we, however we make that happen, we make him whole and he's the customer of the county. He follows all the other, once he's whole again, however you make that happen, I don't care how you make it happen, but you make him whole again, then he becomes a customer of the county and follows the same rules as the rest of the customers. But we're the ones that have caused the issue, so we need to fix that. <clears throat> so my the only own. caveat, I think we're not necessarily, and I fully support doing it, like I'll preface this with that, but I think the original agreement was only for, um, I'm just finding it, in 1990, or 1988, um, only applicable to the current owner, but obviously I think it's the right thing to do is to maintain the service to but them, it was so. still our road, road it was still our fault with not no and i'm not suggest i'm just suggesting yeah. or i'm just clarifying that we're not necessarily bound to but it's clearly the right thing to do um well we are because if the original agreement was for the for the original owner and we didn't do anything when that changed it is our problem mm -hmm. for sure yeah no i fully support cool. um glenn just a or Councilor Custer, just for clarification, did you make a motion? I know you mentioned motion. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to change it. I'm just going to change it. I like Ben's wording better. Glenn, to make if them I whole again. might just consider, um, administration did provide a recommendation. My preference would be if council's willing to consider the recommendation, just because it's a little bit more. Um, open for administration to, like, rather than speaking to specific solutions and vaults and the technical elements to it that is more of an operational element, I think if we just stick to... Um, That's why I said I thought Ben's motion would be a lot better to make them whole again. It's only four words, and I think it takes everything into consideration. Or do the recommendation of, I'm just trying to scroll it up to find it here. So the recommendation is that council approve the funding of the engineering construction. I see that. Yeah, that's basically what Ben said. Yeah, I move the recommendation. Okay. And just for clarity, for my own understanding, that would um, include the connection up to the property line. Is that, am I interpreting so that? So through the chair, this recommendation is basically um, anything that is needed to, like you say, bring it back to what is current service, service level is right now. If we find that that line going up to the house is not adequate, this would resolution includes bringing it back up to um, service service lot. If depending on the pressure is there, depending on what kind of pressure reducing valve, if his line isn't adequate, then um, a cistern, like all that sort of thing. These things are unknowns, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to go onto the property to to verify any of these things. Um, that's why it's a little bit of a uh, an open-ended one here. But and that's why I say that's my recommendation to council. If if you want to stop it at the property line and say after that, that's responsibility of the landowner. Open for suggestions. I think it's the responsibility no, I, of the owner from the property line once we make them whole again. 
Once he's back to it, because he's right now he's operating, and we have no issue. We're going to shut out. We're going to disconnect them. Once we have him whole again, and from then that time forward, he's mm -hmm. responsible for everything from the property line, just like everybody else on the on the, the line, right? The way it should be done, there should be a vault, a Whatever. meter vault at the property line, a pressure reducer at the property line, or before the property line, a curb stop before that. And that's WRC slash county property. Anything from that past, just like any other resident we have, is theirs. That way, if it ever breaks in the future, we're not liable to dig up somebody's yard or anything like that. And I think that's that's the only thing I can support that way. It will be all the all that equipment should be on before that. If we have to put a vault in, it's easy. If you have to put the meter in the house, there is precedent for that in any other house where you put the meter in. But there's probably going to have to be a pressure reducer before that, mm -hmm. okay. no matter what. Question I have, though, and, and I agree with you, with the exception of what happens if there's not enough head pressure. And he requires a cistern because, it, like, a lot of the rest are, like... But like, the engineers figured that wasn't the case at all. So well, I know, but I, I think we have to have that, we have to leave that... Con so what happens if you need, to, if you can't, and you have to have a cistern? I mean, it. it's... It is not advantageous for the for the ratepayer to have a cistern because he's going to then have drip feed into that into that line. But I think we have to be we cannot so we cannot allow we cannot say well he's got water now, but now he's going to have water to his house and then he's on the hook for the fifteen or twenty thousand dollars for the cistern. I, as, I, as much as I hate saying this, I I think we have to make that has to be part of it. Right. What we're doing is interrupting that service. Right, because that and, and that may entail putting a cistern in. Whatever. And then once that cistern is in, then he's we're good we, we our liability stops at the property line, right? Is that correct? How that or are we gonna be responsible for the cistern? I just don't want to be responsible for laying on private property after this is all said and done. Because 20 years down the road, if that cistern fails, pump fails inside that, if you can build it on someone's property, hand it off to them and say it's a one and done, that's fine with me if we absolutely have to do it. I don't think we need to do that from what the engineers had said. They are supposed to get back to our staff to let us know what we need. I don't want it over-engineered. I mean, it's a pretty simple thing to do. And, and and Scott, I agree with you 100%. Just on the on the off chance that there's not enough head pressure, and he needs a drip system in there, like a, a low flow cistern. And so we have to put the cistern in. How do we? Is there some way that we can get administration to say that we're liable for that? While he owns the house, and then after that, it's everything goes with the. No. They can hold it. It's his. So, yeah, question to administration. There's a motion on the floor. Given the current motion, would you be able to construct an agreement with the ratepayer just indicating that sort of our liability, I don't know if there's some kind of, I know nothing about this stuff, warranty period or something yep. with the equipment that we might put in and that our liability would be limited to that warranty period and make that binding so that we just mitigate any. I, I agree with Deputy Reefclaus, and I wouldn't want us to, be held liable for repairs on private property that could impact landscaping or things like that, um, or maintenance, like on the property side. But I agree that we do need to be providing the water service. Correct. Yes, find some administration. I'm like very certain we can do that. I don't think that's very difficult at all. Okay. So the current motion on the floor would be to get the water to the property essentially replacing sort of the level of service that is there now. We'll go with the recommendation as Please. it's written. Go ahead, Councillor Kester. No, it's a continuation of service, uninterrupted, made whole. And then you can get your agreements after the fact, but first thing is to make it the way it was, he had his water, whatever that entails. Yep. Low service, low pressure, high pressure, that's for staff to work out. Yeah, and I think that's what's great about this motion is it gives the liberty to operations mm -hmm. to make it 
um, work with whatever is discovered as they're engineering it. So, any yeah. further questions or discussion regarding the motion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to 4.43, South Truckville contribution. Okay, thank you. Uh, through the chair on page 183 is the uh, RFD for a uh, South Truckville contribution. Uh, so basically this is uh, a request from WRC board to reallocate some of the funds that were, I guess, already allocated towards the truck fill out of the outstanding balance owed to the county um, uh, and take it from the phase one and phase two loan contributions. So. so just for clarity, rather than having the WRC pay that money back to the county and then have the county transfer that money back for the truck fill station, this would just have it happen internally Exactly. I, I think it was more on uh, through the chair, through the uh, WRC board, just needed some clarification on the resolution here stating that specifically. Is that accurate, board members? Yes. Council's wishes. Wake up, guys. I'm going <laughs> to hand out my little tiny cans of Coke to everybody. Tiny with no calories. Yep. That's currently what we've done, is it not? I think this uh, is just well, the to come. stations gotten paid. Yeah, this is, I think, just directing that to come from the phase one and two funds, just for clarity, I think. Because they're already, there's already uh, excess of funds with the board, if I understand correctly gives them the, the the reason or the gives them the ability to access the funds they have and a motion back exactly. it up. Yeah. Cleans up the books. Yeah. Council's wishes. I'll uh, I'll move the council approve the reallocation of funds in the amount of five hundred and forty five thousand dollars from phase one and phase two loan contributions held by the mm -hmm. county or held by the village Rocky Ford to the costs associated with the Wheatland Regional Corporation's South Truck Fill Project. There's a motion on the floor. Any questions or discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Move to 4.44, WID conveyance, conveyance rates. Okay, thank you. Uh, so through the chair on page 186 is the uh, RFD for WID conveyance rates. Um, this is basically just for information. At the October 6 meeting, council discussed the rates and uh, we thought it'd be prudent to bring back some of our investigations on, on how we had determined, well, I guess how the, the rates have been determined. We did a little uh, consultation with WID, have a, a breakdown here just in the current uh, conveyance rates that we're paying in the county here, both for Gleesh and Mirrorfield and, and Rosebud. Uh, as you see, they vary quite a bit. Um, we have a few different rate structures that are proposed to us from WID. Uh, actually, we have the, the agreement for Galician is signed in 2014. It's a 10-year agreement. Uh, we had the rates set every year there um, in this agreement. So they break it down into three different categories. Um, one is residential, two is high user, or sorry, commercial, and then three is large volume so we're dictated as a category one on here um i i confirm with the wid there that we're charged the same rates as other municipalities in the area here for these they're kind of a set rate they're not um they don't change from community community to community on these ones uh, mirfield's a little bit different because it's a high volume user so we pay on a per acre uh foot basis and uh yeah, even though the, the acres are a little bit higher on that, we actually don't use 280,000 or 280 acre feet in there. Um, the rate is quite low, so I would hesitate to renegotiate that because we'll probably come out on the, the losing end of that one. 
Uh, and then the final one is the mere, or sorry, the Rosebud one. That's our thousand acre foot uh, WID allocation that we approved um, or signed off in in 2010 for. Uh, basically, at that time, we paid 300 grand to sign that, enter that agreement, and because of that, we got this much lower conveyance rate um, for future use. So. Yeah, I think on on seventy five hundred cubes, it's a thousand bucks a year. Really, really low conveyance rate, thirteen cents a cube. Um, so I, I, I that one is is set and just goes up by CPI every year. Um, yeah, my question yeah. just on how many users do we have in Muirfield? I just I just want this is just my personal my personal information. Like how many how many accounts do we have? I believe one hundred sixty seven. One five seven. Six, one six seven. One six seven. Yeah, uh, that's off the top of my head. I can get you exacts for sure, but approximately. Well, it's, it's, yeah, no, it's it's fine. I'm just. Yeah, we don't want to touch Mirfields because it's <laughs> substantially less than Galicians. Maybe they won't catch so up. So my question would be, like I like the the unit price for Rosebud. We have that thousand acre feet. What if we were using that for Galician? Because we have a thousand acre feet, like how much more would that be? Another fifty acres? Mm -hmm. Really, like it's nothing compared. We'll still have nine hundred acre feet left. Would that be best for those residents? Will they do that? To use something that we're not, and will they You'd do that? You'd have to look. We're currently in an agreement with Gleeson, so you would need to. When that one expires in twenty twenty four, I'm just thinking the best. Our growth is limited, right? And and. Development pertains on water. Well, we have water for some stuff, but that's still a lot to work with. I'm just trying to think long term for viability of these smaller places would, would help a lot. And that'd be a decision to council, but it's like having a reserves that you can use. So, um, so uh, excellent idea through the chair. We definitely we're going to renegotiate this when, when we get to that point. Um, we've been trying to use this allocation water for 10 years and, and have limited success on, on finding developers. I, I guess when we entered into that, Alberta environment was quite strong that this not be used for existing development, that it was only for new developments. So we had 750 acre feet of that to residential, 250 to commercial, and and it, we based it on communities that had new development starting, like Muirfield. Um, so, because of that, it was it was a little bit. Uh, uh, sorry, not hit Muirfield. Homestead's the one beside Muirfield. The Muirfield resident wasn't um, applicable at that time. Knowing that they've given Rosebud the allowance on here, I think that that viewpoint has changed quite a bit since when we first uh, approached them. So. Um, definitely, we're going to renegotiate this in a few years. And then Muirfield, on, on top of this, the golf course has its own agreement, I would assume. They're not under our license. Mm -hmm. That's correct, yep. yeah. Just so, in case someone asked, I just wanted to make sure that's, that's the case. Uh, I don't know how many acres is the golf course. It's only 300 acres there to begin with. And how many acres? Take a few roads out and parking lots. I think that 279.99 is includes the golf cart. Um, sorry, uh, maybe that's not clear in the spreadsheet. That's actually per acre, acre foot. Feet, yeah. yeah, so that's a water, uh, okay. a, a volume measurement. That's 12, 1,233 cubic meters per acre foot. So. But Mirfield, you got 280 acres. Acre feet. 70. It was honest. Acre feet. Yeah, so 345,000 cubic meters um, is what the units is for Mirfield. Sorry, yeah, that's yeah, not so clear on this that's bridge. one foot. That's one foot for 280 acres. Right? Um, no, so, so sorry. Through the chair, the 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 it should say 279.99 acre feet, which is a volume measurement. Um, I could have put cubic meters in there, which would have been 345,000 cubic meters of water we pay for. Um, 
if that clarifies. Okay. Well, I'll move the recommendations of staff as amended. Accept information. Yeah, it's just to accept his information. <laughs> Would you clarify your motion, Councillor Armstrong? Please. Just to clarify the wording in the, in the, in there. Oh, so to accept his information with the addition of acre feet. feet yeah, as amended. Perfect. I follow now. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. We do correspondence first. Or do you want five minutes? We can take five minutes. We'll take five minutes and come back. Five minutes because I want to warm my truck up. It's cold, old baby. I want to want her to warm up out there while I'm That's fair. through the rest of it. That's fair. We're we taking a five minute break? Yeah, we'll reconvene it. Thank you. I don't know. In five minutes. All the clocks say different times. <laughs> Two twenty six on my computer. <laughs> Correspondence. It's a letter from Municipal Affairs regarding the CMRB. We already re referenced that. Uh, municipal Affairs regarding infrastructure funding. Pretty much, yep. Use it wisely. Um, uh, Minister Shields regarding the irrigation infrastructure funding announcement between GOA and the federal government. Um, organizational meeting correspondence from the villages of Rocky Ford and Hazar and the county of Newell. Letter from Minister Madu with Alberta Justice and Solicitor General. Uh, that was regarding our request for them to consider our support of the watch clerks as uh, for that to be taken into consideration in our police funding. Uh, I think he very nicely said no. Um, and RCMP from Bazano, their quarterly report. We also had circulated, maybe we'll deal with that separate, separately, a uh, request from the Strathmore Horseshoe Club, and their request is simply for a letter of support um, to the Strathmore District Agricultural Society Club. So, um, just Madam Reeve, through through you to Council, I think that's just kind of a a boilerplate, just updates that as a result of their organizational meeting, there was a few changes, and they wanted to let us know of their uh, intermunicipal committee members. So, if there's ever a uh, meeting called, those would be the members that. Yes, that's correct. We just left the committees upstanding in case there's any issues that need to be addressed and there is a review schedule and stuff like that. So. That's correct. So perhaps a motion to accept the correspondence as information. Councillor Armstrong has moved. Any discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. And then just looking if council wants to consider sending a letter of support for the Strathmore Horseshoe Club. Yes, I believe we should. Someone prepared to make a motion. I will make that motion that we give a letter of support to the Strathmore Horseshoe Club. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, regarding our closed session, uh, CAO Henderson did indicate that uh, background information on this has been circulated. Um, that information is confidential. Typically, we don't have a lot of discussion around the early retirement incentive, and so it's at Council's discretion. We can move into closed session if there are any questions or discussion that we need to take place, and if not, we could just um, approve the early retirement incentive 
application. Okay. Okay. Uh, before we move into closed session, I'll just have uh, each councillor affirm, particularly for our councillors um, who are attending the meeting virtually, just affirm that you're in a private setting where you'll be the only person able to access confidential information in order to uphold our council code of conduct. Uh, Councillor Kester? Affirm. Councillor Baker? Um, I'm actually don't see how that can happen unless I go outside. So if you want to wait for a few minutes, I'll get dressed up and go outside. Okay, it'll take us a couple minutes to transfer the call anyways. Okay. Okay, we'll reconvene in two minutes on a oh, closed can session. You have, uh, can you have Brian text the numbers to me, please? Yep, we'll have it sent to you and Councillor Custer. Thank you. We'll reconvene in two minutes. And I moved us, oh, sorry, Scott, just one second. I will move us into closed session. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. So I will move us out of closed session. Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, there's one motion arising from our closed session. I'll, I'll move with, uh, with regret information received from employee number five, 026 and employee number 5033 as they provided notice of retirement and further that Wheatland County provide the retirement incentive to the employees as per county policy retirement incentive program. There's a motion on the floor. Any questions or discussion? Is any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. That completes our agenda. And I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Donna.